Hello, everybody. If you're watching live, as always, please feel free to ask any questions along the way. If you think you might like to come on the show yourself one day, please do get in contact. My details on the channel's about page. Today's guest is Emily Carl. Hello, Emily. Hey, Eddie. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Thanks Fantastic. for having me. Thank you for coming along. Would you like to just introduce yourself quickly? Sure. Uh, my name is Emily Carl. I'm a research software engineer at the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. Fantastic. That's um, awesome. We're going to talk a lot of science today, I think, and um, I'm actually quite excited. So. <laughs> Me too. It's great. Yeah. My favourite topic. <laughs> um, are you happy to just sort of run us through very quickly your childhood and your lead up to today, uh, how things went and what led you to, to science, basically? Yeah, sure. So I sort of didn't really get into computers as like a hobby or a tinkering thing until sort of later on in my life. Uh, I was really much more of a science and maths nerd uh, when I was growing up. Okay. Uh, I sort of grew up in regional Queensland, Australia. And for those who don't know, uh, Australia is very big. And Queensland <laughs> is very big. I think I looked it up before the show just for a comparison. And I think you can fit like France, Germany, Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, Austria in Queensland and still have room to spare. So yeah. there's a lot of big distances between a lot of very small towns. So just, we didn't just... exactly have a thriving computer culture. <laughs> Anecdotally, I actually visited Australia a while ago and I, I had this initial oh, plan to drive from Sydney up to Brisbane. And uh, when I looked at how far that actually was, rather than just looking at the, the map, you know. <laughs> yep, yep. You get that all the time with people. Anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. But no, it was great. Uh, but my parents were both teachers, which was why we okay. were sort of out in central Queensland. And um, so I had a lot of access to educational materials growing up, you know, documentaries and books and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, really fell in love with mathematics at an early age. Okay. Uh, my parents sort of introduced it to me through this book, this children's book called The Number Devil, that was, you know, surprisingly influential on my outlook that, I, you know, I didn't appreciate at the time. Okay. It's a children's book about a, a little boy who kind of doesn't like uh, mathematics and he's struggling with it because uh, he hates maths class at school. Mm -hmm. And he gets visited in his dreams by a little little red devil called The Number Devil teaches okay. him about maths, but does it in a way uh, through, you know, dreamlike imagery and analogy, but through introducing the concept that maths is really, it's a thing of imagination. It's mm -hmm. not about sums and memorizing times tables and all of these arcane procedures that you learn in school. It's really at its heart about you come up with some set of rules and you think about some object like, I don't know, here's how we define a triangle and here's the rules for how you do stuff in geometry, what cool things can we do with that? Mm -hmm. And it it sort of showed it as a puzzle and almost like a game of like, what kind of cool stuff can you think up? And um, really sort of taught me that maths can be fun and creative and beautiful um, at a very early age, which was good because at the time, uh, maths education was still very much rote memorization based, mm. um, depending on the teacher, and very boring. That's that's very interesting. That sounds like a book that I probably would have appreciated back when I was young. Um, is, is math something yeah. you struggled with initially? Is it is that why you were introduced to this book? Or No, uh, I think my parents just had this idea of like, you know, we should get her reading and doing sums and, you know, maths and thinking about this stuff early okay. so she would get a head start at school. It was very much okay. a sort of results focused thing, but it had... I don't think it was an unintended side effect. It had a deliberate side effect of finding yeah. something that I was interested in and then going, right, let's latch on to that. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So nice. it was it was good. And, uh, you know, science is cool. I liked space. I liked okay. dinosaurs, all the normal little kid stuff. And eventually learning that you can use science to do cool stuff and kind of make the world a better place. You know, I wanted to be a scientist from a very early age. Okay. And so was that, was that more of a science was the application of maths and and you sort of started off with, with maths being exciting and, and found its use in science? Or how did that sort of come together? Yeah, I think it was it was very much that. Uh, a lot of sort of popular science stuff that I read as a kid very much treated it as like, wow, these cool facts. Like we've mm -hmm. got, you know, Jupiter, it's got all these moons and cool stuff like that and uh, chemistry, fun fancy reactions, that sort of thing. But really it was discovering sort of physics in high school where it's like, wow, you can take maths and you can use it to predict stuff about how the world works. And you can use it to sort of like 
inform how we interact with the world and to build stuff that really sort of sparked something off in my brain as like okay. this there's something here there's a really interesting symmetry that in some sense the universe runs on maps mm -hmm. that's very cool yeah. <laughs> so that, that's kind of that's kind of how i got into um science and then okay. when i got to university um studying physics i was quite fortunate to be in a program that was it like a pilot program that uh, my university was trialing for like an advanced study program in science that really had a strong like research component. Uh, this is for like bachelor's undergrad. Mm -hmm. And you had to do a certain number of summer research programs with academics um, doing like, you know, sit down, here's a project, kind of figure out something cool within the sort of three month span that you get. Okay. just to get you introduced to the process of doing scientific research. So when you say you, you had to do research projects, was that different? Was that atypical for this level of education? Definitely, definitely. So okay. like for typical undergrad, you can do some research projects as an optional thing. And like, if you know they exist, they're a really good opportunity to sort of like get some experience with what science is like and get to know what you like and what you don't like. Mm -hmm. But it's often not that well advertised as like a thing you can do. So a lot of people don't end up doing it um, just because they don't know it's there. And mm -hmm. so this program was to try and address that and say, no, you have to do this to graduate, uh, which is okay. very, very different. And, it, you know, so, and you mentioned this as a pilot program as well. Was there sort of teething issues with that? Or is it does it go reasonably well and actually, you know, everyone on the course enjoyed it and and succeeded in inverted commas and how did that work out yeah i think there were sort of teething issues in sort of figuring out how to i don't know i i guess get the capacity to support that many students doing research projects because right. obviously someone has to supervise them right mm. and researchers have to supervise them so you need to make sure that there are enough professors who are willing to <laughs> take on these students to actually make sure everyone can get a project yeah. Um, and I gather there were some issues early on in the program, but by the time I came through, it was relatively, relatively okay. smooth sailing. And awesome. now it's a, a standard thing that University of Queensland offers. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Um, can you tell us about maybe one or two of your, the projects you actually worked on then during your, uh, your degree? Sure, sure. So uh, probably the first one that really sort of uh, kicked it off was a project in quantum physics, which is what I was really interested in at the okay. time, um, about atomic physics and atomic clocks in particular. And uh, I mean, do you know much about, about this, about atomic clocks or atoms or anything? Not a lot. Um, I know the name Rubidium, <laughs> sure. and I know that they're very good at accuracy, you know, time precision and things, but um, please feel yeah. free to fill us in, yeah. Well, that's, that's the important the important stuff from a sort of lay <laughs> perspective. Okay. But how they work is um, atoms, they're sort of, you have some positively charged nucleus and you have negatively charged electrons and they form a bound system because they have an attractive potential with each other. And so that model that you learn in high school science class of like a nucleus and then electrons orbiting around it like a planet, mm -hmm. that's not really correct but it's kind of <laughs> time to close enough for yeah. our purposes <laughs> okay you know we would not have time to go into the real stuff here but the important thing to sort of know is that your electrons they exist in what are called orbitals or shells if you might remember that from chemistry mm -hmm. uh, and your electron can't exist at just sort of arbitrary distances from the nucleus it can exist at say uh, a shell that might have an energy here or here so this is like a a lower energy, this like is a, a higher level energy. one and a level two, maybe level one, level two. Yeah, yeah, that's a good okay. analogy. Um, but it can't exist at level one and a half, it's discrete. Gotcha. Okay, so the energy in your atom is what is called quantized, it comes in quanta, which are packets, and this mm -hmm. is where we get the term quantum theory from. And your electron can either absorb energy, usually from a photon, uh, to jump up from level one to level two and it can drop down from level two to level one, and it can emit energy also in the form of a photon. Okay. That photon has a very specific color or a frequency that is proportional to the energy it has. With me As so far? How many, how many levels it drops? Is that the energy? Uh, yeah, so the Maybe. difference in energy between the levels. Okay. Yeah, so right. the, the energy of each level is going to depend on the atom. So right. hydrogen will have a different 
level one energy or ground state energy, as we say in physics, than helium or rubidium or any of these other ones. Okay. And it all just depends on the interplay between the charge of the nucleus and the number of electrons it has. And, you know, you have to solve some complicated mathematics called the Schrodinger equation to figure this out exactly. But the general idea is it's different between atoms and it's characteristic of atoms. So that sort of energy that you absorb to jump between states is the same for every atom of a particular element. It's almost like a fingerprint in that sense. Okay. That's very so interesting. So if we could share the screen, I might be able to oh, give sure. you a, a physical demonstration. Okay. Uh, or at least a picture to help visualize it. So can you see all right? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Yeah, yeah. So these are the shells, the orbitals of the hydrogen atom, which fortunately is a uh, single electron, so it's relatively easy to figure out what it does. Okay. So this little circle one is the ground state energy, the level one energy, and the lowest energy of the hydrogen atom. So the electron can kind of exist anywhere within this shell here, this sphere. And if we wanted to jump up to another energy, level, this one here, you can see that it's got this weird dumbbell shape, right? Mm -hmm. So your electron can kind of exist in these clouds here and here, but kind of not out to the side. Okay. And then again, you jump up and you get these kind of even weirder shapes that's got like a donut so sorry, with a dumbbell in the middle of it. Just to clarify then, is, yeah? is, is the second level there the first level wrapped around with, with extra around it? Is it sort of, um, can we see level one in the middle just underneath your mouse there? I or mean, what are we looking at? How, how, do we, kind of how do we rationalize word. it? <laughs> okay, so what these are, this is a good point. I should sort of take it back a step. What these are are really probability densities. Okay. So you've got a probability of finding the electron within this space in your atom. So if you mm -hmm. were to somehow like look at it with a microscope, this is very hand wavy stuff, but yeah. say, where is the electron right now? you could find it with an equal probability at anywhere along this surface. Okay. And then a lower probability as it drops off. So then for the second level, this thing's kind of like, it is in there in a sense, but if the electron is in the second level, really you find it on any of these surfaces with an equal probability, but not in this one because it's not in that state. Does that okay. kind of make sense? I think I see. So, and yeah, and then I think guess the question I was asking the the one that your mouse is currently over the second row down. Yep. Does that surface intersect or is that near or is it far away from the top? Oh, it's, uh, it's we're getting too away. deep on this one. <laughs> no, 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 it's all good. It's all good. Um, so the top one, you can probably think of it as sitting in the middle here. Yes. Okay. That's what I so, suspect. Cool. Yeah. So the, um, the sort of shells get more diffuse and spread out the further right. out you get, the higher okay. energy. And the further you get from the nucleus, it's kind of like gravity. If you have something that's up really high from a planet, it's mm -hmm. got a lot of gravitational potential energy. So when it drops down, it'll have a high speed when it hits the ground. Okay. Same deal here. Further away from the nucleus, it's got a high energy. It needs to get a lot of energy as it zips down close to it. Was that, was that okay? Did I at least... <laughs> I think I think I'm following idea. enough. I won't I won't okay. dig too much further because you're not here to explain it to me. You're here to share your cool stuff. So so please go. Yeah, on. yeah. Oh, I hope that was okay. So no, that's good. go back to the uh the camera if you want. Yeah, sure. There we go. Yeah, so how an atomic clock works is you have these two states and mm -hmm. they're separated by some energy. And what you want to do for any kind of clock is you want some kind of oscillator that has a known frequency. That right. sort of think of like a pendulum in a grandfather clock. It ticks back and forth at a known rate, and then you can use that to measure how much time has passed in a certain number of ticks. Mm -hmm. In an atomic clock, your tick is the number of times that an electron dips up and down between these energy levels. So it'll jump up, okay. jump down, that sort of thing, and it'll oscillate and wiggle back and forth. So and to do that, oh, sorry. No, Go carry on. on. I think you're just about to answer one of my questions. <laughs> Feel free to, to interrupt at any point but you have to drive it with some kind of electromagnetic radiation to give it the energy that it needs to jump up and then it'll fall back down again and then it gets excited back up and so on. Okay. So you drive it with either a microwave or a laser and it'll have some characteristic frequency that you can predict from quantum mechanics and you can use that then to measure the passage of time really, really precisely. That's very interesting. Um, so I had always presumed that atomic clocks were based on decay and half-lives and, and things like that. 
that's not true. Um, they no. actually oscillate and they they sort of wiggle the electrons like a quartz clock will wiggle the quartz. Is that yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, quartz is a great analogy. You're using some Very energy, you're pumping energy into it to get it kind of jiggle back and forth at yeah. some characteristic frequency and measuring okay. the jiggles. Very cool. So after yeah. that deep dive, that's probably a little bit deeper than you planned on. Apologies. Sure. Um, no, what was good. the project doing? What you know, you uh, look at these these energy states, and uh, can you expand on sort of what you had to do for your project? Yeah. So for this project, we were really interested in how light and atoms. Uh, interact with each other. So the sort of wrinkle to the story that I just gave you is that your uh, atomic clocks, you're not doing them in like an ideal frictionless vacuum at zero degrees Kelvin that you okay. get on like sort of exam questions. They exist in the real world mm -hmm. and there's lots of outside interference that messes with your clock. So the example we're interested in is you have some equipment that you build your clock out of the physical stuff, it has some non-zero temperature. And mm -hmm. so it gives off some kind of thermal radiation. It's a bit like the heating element in your oven or in a space heater, except at a, like a lower temperature, smaller. Right. Okay. But it still gives off electromagnetic radiation that when it gets your atom and the wiggling, it kind of jiggles it about a bit, not enough mm -hmm. to drive a transition, but enough to kind of mess with it. So you'll get different uh, clock frequencies in the presence of this radiation than you would just in a purely isolated system off in the middle of nowhere. Okay. And if you want to do really precise measurements of time, you need to be able to account for those differences in your clock based on outside perturbations, right? To be able to actually get the good measurements. And so we were trying to find ways to account for that and to really put a, a number on how much this thermal radiation changes the sort of clock frequencies of various atomic clocks uh, and be able to then pass that on to people who are building these things so that they can better account for these effects in their experiments. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? That's amazing. Um, yes, I think that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So the thing with quantum mechanics that's kind of true. Oh, oh, did you have any questions before we start? I don't <laughs> want to go barreling off. Oh. I've just got lots of science questions, I'm afraid, so I won't. Oh, please, won't. go ahead. Are you, are you sure? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. If you want to talk about science, I'm so, happy sorry. to do that. And that's not really. Anyway, never mind. Uh, so you've got these these atoms in their states, or the electrons in their states. Yeah. And the sort of the background radiation or the thermal radiation of, of the, the thing that they are in is impacting them and changing things. You said, yes. I think, earlier that you can't get it to change state unless you give it precisely the right energy you can't take it to like yes. one and a half you have to take it precisely to Correct. two and presumably yes. you know 1.999 isn't enough as well or or does yes. it like have a tolerance to it so what is the effect why does the frequency change i guess is my question so like, what i might do is maybe <laughs> share the screen and i'll give yeah, you another sure. demonstration another okay. image this one yeah i remember this one from school bit. yeah yeah so here's your n equals one orbital, n yep. equals two, et cetera. You can jump between them. This is maybe a little bit clearer than the other one. I'm sorry. <laughs> one. So how it happens, because you're correct that it can't absorb 1.999. It has to be exact with some tolerance, some yep. little tolerance. So what happens is when you have, let's say this is our um, sort of the shape of the electromagnetic field that our nucleus puts out. It's a sphere, right? So mm -hmm. we've got a point charged nucleus in our approximation, and it puts out a perfectly charged, uh, a perfectly spherical sort of potential. It, that's the physics term we call it. You mm -hmm. can think of it like a hill in gravity, right? If you have right. some hill, stuff will roll down into the middle from the top. Same mm -hmm. deal here. It's a, it's a potential. Further out, you get the more potential energy you have. And it's radially symmetric. So everywhere along this orbital here has the same potential energy due to mm -hmm. the nucleus. You with me so far? Yep. Yep. So it's a sphere. So now from sort of electromagnetism, let's say we apply some electric field, some static electric field that points in this direction. So we now have some external sort of field that's acting on this atom. What that tends to do is it kind of squishes the potential and makes it instead kind of an 
oval or an oblong. So it'll okay. be like longer this way and shorter this way. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a very hand wavy explanation, but that's <laughs> roughly what happens, right? Okay. And so that doesn't drive the electrons to change state, but it does change what these orbitals have as their energy. Okay. So this is this is called polarization and polarizability. Okay. So it's kind of like your sphere that was perfectly spherical now becomes like a football shape or something, and it's polar. And uh, that changes the, the fundamentals of your system. And it's characterized by a number called the atomic polarizability. <laughs> and that's for a static uh, field, but electromagnetism is sort of wiggling back and forth at some characteristic frequency. So I'm going to need to use my hands. Could we zip back to the, the camera? Sure. Yeah, yeah. OK. Your atom is kind of doing this. Not okay. really, but it's kind of doing this in time with the field as it goes. Right. And that induces a change in your electronic structure, very small, but measurable. Fascinating. So okay. it's not so much that it's driving the electrons, it's just changing what frequency they move at because it's changing the shape that they see. This is kind of like the, the fact that the, the entire universe is expanding all at the same rate sort of thing, isn't it? Where you're changing yeah. the shape of a thing, but you can't tell that you're changing the shape of it unless you're looking at it from like a certain point or view, viewpoint, maybe? maybe? Yeah, that's an interesting analogy. Like maybe an analogy could be like, you know, that an, uh, thing from a couple of years back, gravitational waves, mm -hmm. got the Nobel Prize, and it was a really big discovery with some, you know, big yeah. European and American collaborations where they had two black holes kind of orbiting <laughs> each other and, and this incredibly energetic effect, it caused like, they call, call it the fabric of space itself to kind of do this rippling mm. effect. And that makes stuff in space kind of change shape, but you, it's not really obvious unless you've got really, really precise yeah. measurements. Interesting. Okay. Hopefully that made it more clear rather oh. than less clear. That's always the... Yes, this, this, is, this is, you know, advanced physics and, and we're not going to cover <laughs> it properly in this, this stream. So uh, let's not try, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for trying. I'll try my best. I hope it was at least you yeah, know, no, somewhat it's, enlightening. It's fascinating. So your, your work was studying these the atomic behavior i think is probably the right way of phrasing yeah, it yeah but but your your real focus i guess was on the software and the computation behind that is that right yeah okay so like in physics we i, I guess a bit of terminology before i start yeah um if when we talk about wanting to solve some equation or some system we typically have two ways that we talk about doing it we have either like analytic solutions or numerical solutions. Okay. So an analytic solution is your typical pencil and paper, or I guess in a movie, a chalkboard or that sort of thing. But we still do use chalkboards and whiteboards <laughs> a bit. They're a great tool. Um, and what you try to do is you try to write down some exact equation with like a finite number of terms that exactly solves the problem that you're interested in. So like an example I like is, let's say you've got two points in space and you want to figure out the line that connects them, right? You can always draw a straight line between two points. Mm -hmm. You want to figure out the equation of that line. You can do some algebra if you know the positions of the points and you can get an exact equation of the form y equals mx plus c, which will give you a straight line. And that's, you can just calculate that to whatever level of precision that you want. You can manipulate it. You can do calculus with it. You can do all this fun stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of preferable if you can do that because it's a, a it gives you in some sense a sort of like a more powerful calculational tool is it is it the precision i guess the absolute result almost yeah yeah you're working okay. in the abstract space of like symbols and algebra and that sort of stuff and so you don't get round off error you don't yeah. get you know things from computing sort of coming into things and messing okay. things up. It's kind of pure and abstract. And then what you can do is you can derive some exact equation, uh, go through all the way in like exact terms. And then when you need to actually calculate something, you can just plug numbers into that equation and then away you go. You only have mm -hmm. to do the calculation once. Okay. But the downside is there's kind of a, there a limited set of problems for which you can do that. Some of them are just not tractable analytically. So you have to use what's called a numerical approach to solve these I feel things. Like, I feel like tractable is a word I know, but I couldn't define <laughs> it right now. Can you help us with that? Uh, it means you can't do it. You can't make progress with it. Okay. 
Right. You'll just spin your wheels trying to get it done, but okay. you won't get anywhere. Okay. Fair enough. And obviously different uh, problems have different levels of tractability for different levels of smart sure. mathematicians. What's <laughs> tractable for me is probably different to what's tractable for a pure mathematician. Or that sort of thing. <laughs> okay. It's all relative. Yeah. So what, what we want to do instead for a lot of these problems is numerical solutions, where instead we try to find approximations that are kind of like close enough. And right. we want to get them to be good enough accuracy that we can then give them to someone in an experimental lab and they can use them to sort of make predictions about what will happen when they do an experiment. I, I think a good example of how you might do this is going back to our straight line example, what if instead of having two points, you had a whole bunch of points that don't quite exactly sit on a straight line, but you want to do like a linear regression or something and you want to find a line of best fit like mm -hmm. what uh, line or what equation sort of best matches the spread of points that you get. In that case, what you might do is you might do a approach where you don't get an exact sort of plug all these things in and do it. Well, you kind of do, but it's a lot of terms. So you get a mm -hmm. computer to solve it for you. And that gets you kind of an approximate solution of a line. Okay. And does this, does this then produce, I guess, probabilities of where the point might be around the line rather than it's going to be on this line. It'll be it sort of, a, it might be in this space almost. Yeah. It necessarily okay. introduces some degree of uncertainty yeah. both from a, a pure mathematical perspective, because you're using approximations, mm -hmm. you're doing something where you've got some, you know, complicated infinite sum and you say, okay, well, we can't calculate an infinite number of terms. So we're just going to truncate it after a certain set of points and only calculate, you know, the first three okay terms in it. And there'll be some round off error from that that's just intrinsic to the equation, but also round off error because computers, of course, do floating point maths and have finite precision in that right. regard. So you've got to manage both of those to get a good quality solution. Okay. That's very Actually, interesting. I just, I just thought of maybe another good analogy that, uh, like, there's a lot of stuff going on about machine learning and deep mm -hmm. learning in the news right now. And one of the typical ways that you might uh, think of this is like, a neural network is kind of a numerical approximation to some complicated function. You're taking something that you know how to calculate, which in this case is the network weights, and you're trying to find a pretty good approximation to some underlying real process that would be far too complicated to model exactly. Okay. So that kind of approach, maybe, I don't know. And and would I be right in thinking that that the numerical where you don't get an absolute output is is almost like brute forcing a little bit where you are trying over and over again how about this how about this how about this and you get yeah like a, a certainty for each attempt almost yeah yeah okay. so you might think of like a an optimization problem where you've got some function and you want to find the minim minimum point so it might be some curvy curvy function mm -hmm. you want to find where it's at its smallest you know a numerical approach to do this might be something called gradient descent where you start at some point uh, and this is also commonly used in a lot of, you know, neural network training, which is why I bring it up. It's okay. kind of a hot topic right now. But yeah. um, you have your, you start with some point on your function and you calculate what's the value of my function here. And then you calculate what's the slope uh, in each direction, kind of like standing on a hill. You're mm -hmm. like, which direction is uphill? So then okay. you find, you move a little bit uphill, just like yeah. a tiny amount. And then you do the process again. You say, okay, now which way is uphill? Then you move in that direction. Yeah. And then you sort of go, okay, now which way is uphill? And you slowly <laughs> inch your way up, only ever moving uphill, and eventually you'll get to the top. And so presumably at some point you will go downhill, at which point you discard that route, you try a different yeah. route, and you end up going exactly. uphill eventually. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and you get to a point where you're like, okay, well, every direction is downhill. I must be at the top of the mountain. There you go. Magic. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. That's, Thank that's you. the basic idea behind numerical computing. And you can yeah. do this with a pencil and paper. It's all just like sums, basically. Completely but... impractical, though. It's Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Okay. You've got to get a computer to do it for you. And often okay. you want to do lots of parallel operations and find some way to sort of spread it out across multiple computers to mm -hmm. sort of cut down on the simulation time. Because it's okay. a lot of maths. I think we're going to come on to multiple computers and big computers later, but sure. Um, this is yeah, this is very interesting stuff. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, so this stuff was really 
was my introduction to programming and computers as a whole okay. because you kind of in quantum physics, the atoms that we're interested in, like rubidium, like you said, mm -hmm. um, but also things like helium or really anything other than hydrogen, you have to do these numerical approaches to predict these electron energies. They're just completely intractable trying to do it analytically. And I had never programmed a computer before in my life. I played video games and done mods and sort of mm -hmm. stuff like that. But, you know, my PhD supervisor said, well, uh, not PhD supervisor, getting ahead of myself. My supervisor <laughs> at the time said, well, you better learn, you know, you're going to have to yeah. learn how to program. So I, I sort of dove in the deep end, learned Python, Brilliant. learned a lot of these numerical computing techniques and uh, ended up writing some code to calculate some of these cool properties. That's yeah. Awesome. Well done for, for diving in as well. Cause that's potentially quite a scary thing if you've never really done much of that before. It was, it was. And um, the guy was who was supervising, oh, sorry. I was going to say, was it largely enjoyable or was it real uphill battle of, of, I want to do this, I'm going to do this? You know, how did you find it? It was challenging at first because it's a very different mode of thinking. You have mm -hmm. to, you have to get used to the idea that a computer will do exactly what you tell it to, <laughs> unerringly. And yeah. that's not necessarily what you mean for it to do. If it does the wrong thing, that's your fault, as a <laughs> not the computer's fault. I think as well, and, one of the one of the things, even for simple maths that, that I sometimes mm. get involved in is translating an equation from paper or from th theoretical maths, whatever you want to call it, onto something that a smallish or, or largish computer could do well, efficiently, with enough precision, whatever it might be. And knowing how to make that yeah. translation is is a real experience for me at least i'm not sure if you've sort of got got into it these no, days but it's hard yeah it's a genuinely difficult problem like people make their entire careers out of figuring out you know slightly more efficient and accurate ways to do like matrix multiplication or you know calculate mm. some optimization like i just described it's it's yeah. a whole active area of mathematical research that like people are still trying to figure out new ways to do it even in 2023 <laughs> yeah yeah, and like you have to, you have to really understand the problem that you're trying to solve to be able to explain it to a computer, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to break it down into the sort of fundamental steps as you go, yep. and it's almost like explaining it to a very literal-minded person. To be like, no, you have to do this, then you have to do this, then you have to do this. <laughs> I think there was some quote about uh, comparing level of your own understanding with your ability to explain it to, like a five-year-old or. A, yeah. a 10 year old or or how you know someone who's at varying levels of of your experience and exactly. being able to break things down to a computer which is well currently dumb you know it can't do anything yes. by itself it is um yeah. it's probably the ultimate test of that i guess yeah exactly and i think going on through my university career like i i loved programming once i got the hang of it I uh, took all of the electives that I could, all the computational physics electives, all the programming electives that I could fit in, and ended up getting a dual major of physics and computational science out of it. Okay. Um, I found that my computational courses really solidified my understanding in a way that just doing the sort of standard, you know, solve these problems on a notebook under exam conditions really didn't. You know? <laughs> you, and especially since for like computational stuff, you can often generate like visualizations of what's going on. You can hook your code mm. into a plotting library. We're going to come up, up to that again as well, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> so it's really good for getting intuition about how a system works because you can see it do its thing and you can, you know, you can really get it into your head. The human brain likes pictures. Yeah. We like seeing things. Definitely, definitely. Okay. Let's move on. Yeah. Let's move on to your, your physics. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's called an on honors and I'm not yes. fully fully aware of what that means. So can you just sort of tell us what you did and, and, and what it is maybe? Sure, sure. So, you know, it's a, it's a kind of postgraduate, I guess, degree okay. that I didn't realize until sort of we were speaking really well, that was, might have, not be universal. You have to acknowledge that maybe my academic speak isn't up to scratch either. So it may be that <laughs> it's more sure, universal sure. Than, than, than I am aware of it. <laughs> either way. <laughs> One is, is kind of like a postgraduate degree. Uh, it's sort of if you took like a master's degree mm -hmm. where you've got some degree of coursework and you've got some degree of research uh, and you have to sort of produce a thesis at the end of it, except instead of a master's degree is in Australia, at least typically done over two years, 
honors is done over one year and you really sort of have to compress everything down. So okay. instead of doing coursework, then project, you do coursework and project at the same time as postgraduate level coursework. So like advanced quantum field theory, advanced thermodynamics, advanced <laughs> computational <laughs> physics, and right. you have to juggle both of those. Ooh. So is this a is this a decision that you made to take the course in that that way, or is this how the course is available? So it's offered as a way to get a kickstart in uh, going into a PhD. Okay. So doing an honors, it's kind of not a great deal if you don't want to do a PhD. It's a hell of a lot of stress for not much benefit. Right. Um, but if you do really well in honors, you get what's called first class honors. So that's the equivalent of average high distinction across all of your coursework and thesis. Then you can go straight into a PhD. So you can shave an extra year off your uh, career. Oh, wow. okay. And yeah. usually if you've got class one honors, universities take that as a sign that like, okay, you know what you're talking about. You're ready for a PhD. It's really like a, a crucible that okay. sort of forges you into a researcher through extreme stress and too much caffeine. <laughs> And they will often give you a PhD scholarship as a result. Okay. So like, uh, it means you don't have to work while doing a PhD as much. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately in Australia, PhD scholarship is not indexed to cost of living, or at least it wasn't when I did my PhD and Sydney, where I did my PhD is a very expensive city, uh, mm -hmm. compared to where I did my undergrad. So a PhD scholarship, you know, if you do it in a regional university, like, you know, there's Townsville in North Queensland, which is a relatively small town and very cheap, mm -hmm. you can live like a king on your PhD scholarship. Whereas okay. in Sydney, you're, you know, living on two minute noodles and you know, <laughs> scrounging uh, any event that has catering that you can get free food. Interesting. So it's a bit of a tricky system. Okay. Um, can we just, one second, I just opened the blinds because the oh, sun's sure. coming yeah. up. So. Yeah. The light is uh, a little bit weird right now. Okay. It's uh, time zone differences. It's morning in uh, in Brisbane and yes, it's um, time in the UK. It's, it's quite dark outside here. <laughs> yes, because it's winter over there, right? Well, it was actually a really Autumn. nice day, nice spring day. Oh, so wow. yeah, yeah, great, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, honors back to honors. Yeah. So um, so what did you do? And and tell us about the yeah the, the course. Yeah. The research project was really sort of the most uh, interesting part to this um, conversation. And that was again with the guy who I did this summer research project with in undergrad, an academic by the name of Michael Bromley. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic, interesting character. He's like a surfer dude from Darwin, okay. which is like Northern Australia. Uh, so he'd talk about everything being like groovy or it's real gnarly <laughs> and yeah, weird, weird dude. But you know, physics <laughs> is great for, for weirdos. So it's a great place. So yeah. not necessarily uh, Bromley, he was kind of normal weird, but right. there are some real weird, weird people in physics. Okay. And my PhD advisor used to joke that like physics is great because for the cost of a one academic salary, you can keep a extreme weirdo off the streets and they're not <laughs> doing like financial engineering and crashing the global uh, oh. <laughs> economy or leading revolutions or that sort of stuff. They're safely squirreled <laughs> away doing quantum field theory stuff. <laughs> occupied <laughs> yeah but no uh Bromley was a great supervisor um okay. he was a real old school fortran programmer like came up from uh the days when his university where he, he did his phd in darwin they didn't really have a computing program so he was like kind of bootstrapping it from the ground doing half electrical engineering half physics half maths and oh, wow. doing all this yeah. stuff so he had an interesting perspective which is that like computation was really expensive back in those days. Mm -hmm. And so you wanted to do as many aggressive optimizations before you write the code as possible so that you can actually get a result in a reasonable period of time. Okay. And this approach is still needed in like high performance computing and scientific computing. Um, but it's sort of, you can get away with a little bit more sloppiness because computers are just so much more powerful. Mm -hmm. Uh, depending on the field, obviously, but like back then you had to count every like byte of memory and you had these things where like if you're storing data to disk, there's like a limit on how big the file sizes can be. So if you've got a lot of data, you have to have these complicated processes to split it up, chunk mm -hmm. it between files and sort of shard it across multiple nodes to get this stuff. <laughs> and his pedagogical tactic uh, was 
Before you write any code, you should understand the system and simplify it as much as possible. So when I started my honors project, he said, you've got a little bit more time to work stuff out than a summer project. So yeah. what I want you to do is not write any code at all. And I want you to sit down with a pencil and paper, and I want you to calculate the ground state energy of helium without using a computer, just using a pocket calculator. So you have to do the maths and grind through the sums on a pencil and paper as if I was a, a computer, basically, yeah. <laughs> to get the answer and then code that into an Excel spreadsheet so that you can kind of observe what the numbers are okay. doing in real time. Then you understand the problem and then you are allowed, in a sense, to go and write code. Okay. Very unusual way of teaching computational physics, but it really, I think it really worked and it gave me a yeah. different perspective on how to do this stuff. So was like, this, this, is this an exercise also, that allowed you to see optimization strategies or, or whatever, or is this just to really get you to understand what it was you were doing? Bit of both, bit of both. Okay. It was more about the understanding, right? you know, but also if you're doing it by hand, you're of course going to want to find shortcuts. Yes. You're going to want to find the thing that requires the least amount of arithmetic and mm -hmm. the least amount of paper. And that can sort of give you an intuition for what kind of approximations you can make on a computer. Okay. You know, they, they transfer across in both cases. It's the same maths and the code that we write has to represent the same underlying physics of reality mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Can I ask a question? And that Go is ahead. when you were doing this on pencil and paper or, or pen yeah. and paper, did uh, presumably you made mistakes and you yep. had to go back and fix it and you know it wasn't correct or, or perfect first time mm -hmm. okay so it's not not yeah. like just doing that sort of gave you this extra sort of almost slowness and methodical approach that would make it more likely correct because I know a lot of the time when people write software it goes wrong and then you have to go and figure out why it's going wrong and this yes. can be a real time uh time sink yes. so was this was the same kind of thing true with writing out these calculations on paper? Yeah, I mean, anyone who tells you they never make mistakes when doing <laughs> sums on pencil and paper is lying. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I definitely made errors where it's like, oh, I've written down, sometimes it's just transposing digits. It's like, oh, I've written a, you know, a three here, when it, a two, three instead of a three, two or something. That's right. why that, that's the wrong answer. But sometimes it's just like mistakes in algebra where you've got like, the classic joke of I've got a, a sign error, there's a minus one flo floating around through here somewhere, <laughs> or I get a final uh, result and it's a factor of two larger than it should be. Right. Um, and you go, okay, time to try and hunt down where I've introduced a factor of two or where okay. I've missed a one on half. And so it is almost like debugging in a sense. You're yeah. sort of methodically stepping through to try and isolate these sorts of, these sorts of mistakes. And, the, and, and then eventually you get it. And then how large would these calculations be? You know, I'm I'm experienced with maybe like half a sheet or maybe a whole sheet for a big one. You know, are we talking yeah. about many sheets of calculations or, or okay? Yeah, so for a calculation of like the um the spectra the ground state of like the helium atom in like the sort of simplest way you can do it. I won't go into the specifics, we've already kind of okay. gone too far into the weeds, <laughs> I think. But it's uh it's doable. Um yeah on like maybe four H4 sheets of paper. Okay. If you really sort of don't muck around. And, and, and then to compare the the paper method versus on a computer, um, well, is there a way to compare it? You know, what are we talking about in terms of Python, if you're using Python still, uh, lines of code almost, or um, time to run, you know, what are we talking about? This is kind of like, this is a, Kind of like in everything in software engineering, how do you measure complexity, right? Like, yeah. what does it mean to say this is a complicated piece of software? Lines of code can be misleading. Oh, like absolutely. If, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, just, I, think I, I guess I'm code, just trying to get a feel for yeah. how it was writing on paper versus writing the software to do it for you. And uh, maybe even more of a subjective how your experience was as well. How did you find it sure. doing those two different routes? Yeah. I, I think lines of code is not a bad metric for when you're doing numerical programming, because in a sense, like you've got some function that calculates some, mm -hmm. you know, thing where you're calculating all the terms in some infinite sum or, you know, truncated sum. And so each line of code corresponds to like an arithmetic operation or, mm -hmm. you know, a process in your mathematical step. So it is, it's not quite a one-to-one, -one, but it's like a pretty good metric for 
the uh, complexity, at least for the stuff I was doing in my honors, because it was just me writing the code. I didn't really have to worry too much about <laughs> making it uh, understandable to other people and doing like fancy user input passing and that, which was a little bit irresponsible. And I learned that later on, <laughs> okay. but it was, it was about as simple as you could get. Right. And then you have like runtime as a separate method that depends not just on the complexity of the underlying thing you're trying to solve, but also how well you implement it. Mm -hmm. And so in this Python stuff, um, the, the stuff that I was doing in my honors, it ended up being, I don't know, like uh, about a thousand lines of code okay. uh, to do all of this for whatever arbitrary atom you want to plug into it. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you're talking production code bases, the stuff I was working on later on in my PhD, which was a collaborative effort between my PhD supervisor and me, that ended up being about 100,000 lines of code. Um, okay. And now the code that I work on, I think that's right. I don't know. I might be wrong there. It's been a while <laughs> since I looked at the code base. No worries. But the stuff that I work on now, we're talking millions of lines of code. But it's wow. also a lot more fully featured. It does a lot. It's a lot more bells and whistles and okay. that sort of stuff. Very so interesting. That's sort of an idea. And my yeah, experience yeah. with translating it is just that, like, it is, it is a skill set that is separate from just being good at maths. Yes. Knowing how to talk to a computer and how to translate it into this formula, like I said, is tricky. But I found it. I, I found I have a, a talent for it and a bit of a, mm -hmm. a bit of a knack. I kind of am good at getting in the mindset of thinking about how a computer would solve this. And that sort of pencil and paper approach of constantly looking for shortcuts, often as you're writing it, you'll think like, hang on, yeah, okay, so this thing is an invariant. I can sort of hoist this outside the loop and only calculate it once for the infinite series mm -hmm. and treat it as a, a cons constant. I keep saying infinite series. It's not. It's a finite series, but like we <laughs> really, want to make really it big. big enough so that we can <laughs> approximate it. And the difference between the infinite result and the finite result is small enough that it doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Just like mentally substitute that in your head. No, no, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, Apologies, yeah, so we, we took a diversion into no, it's all good. In, into writing it out and code and things. But um, your your physics honors was the the main project where I was related to helium, I think. And uh, yes, do you want to talk about that a bit? Sure, sure. Uh, helium is my favorite atom. It's it's great. Okay. It is pretty much the perfect test bed for quantum mechanics, um, or at least certain types of quantum mechanics, because it's got two electrons. It's element mm -hmm. number two on the periodic table, and because it's got those two electrons, it means that you don't get an exact solution. You can't just write down, here is the equation, substitute it in. You've got to do this numerical stuff. But it's really simple. It's tractable for you know some degree of precision with a pen and paper. And if you do it on a computer, you can get even higher precision. But it's still kind of got a lot of these rich quantum effects by having just multiple interacting bodies. So you can study things that you would normally see in much more complicated atoms in helium, but it's a faster process and an easier process. And helium's also really nicely behaved experimentally. It's a noble gas, which means it doesn't react with anything. You don't have to worry about chemical reactions or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it's a relatively stable atom in terms of external perturbations, because it's like it's quite tightly bound. The, the electrons are quite tightly bound to the nucleus. So that kind of wibble wobble is less pronounced in helium than it is in okay. some other atoms. So experimentalists can measure the properties of helium to a very, very high degree of precision. So we've got really, really good experimental data co to compare against, and we can do really, really high precision calculations, which means it's basically the perfect test bed for methods in atomic physics. You can code it up in helium, and if it works well in helium, and you can verify that it works out too, we're talking like you know, six or 10 decimal places even, mm -hmm. then you can be pretty sure that it'll work okay in other atoms as well. Not certain, but, you know, it's a good sign that you, yeah. you're under something good. Okay. And we were testing uh, photon atom interactions with helium. And again, this sort of like, how much does your, if you've got some external electromagnetic field, how much does it cause the, the sort of potential from the nucleus to sort of wibble wobble around? Um, very science terms for yeah, that. No, I love them. <laughs> uh, the polarizability, basically. And we right. came to this this thing where, like, 
nobody really had like a good expression for how to calculate to arbitrary accuracy. Because ideally what you want is something where you can just keep adding more terms onto your sum and keep getting better and better accuracy. And at that point, there was no real published method that we knew of. There might've been in some old Russian journal of physics or something like that, right. but there was no method that we knew of that was like, you can calculate some of these complex polarizabilities. You can uh, do all of these sort of really funky electromagnetic field interactions uh, and predict how this will affect the atom to essentially arbitrary precision. And my the goal of my honors project was to come up with a technique where we could take relatively standard tools from atomic physics, plug them into some new set of code, and then use that to get this behavior out to whatever level of precision we cared about based on just how much compute time did we have available. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the, the sort of use case we were interested in there was um, kind of like a astrophysics type approach. Helium right. is pretty common in uh, the universe. Mm -hmm. And as your sort of light from distant objects sort of travels through helium gas, it's going to get attenuated somewhat and it's going to scatter. And we want to know like, what is the scattering rate of helium for all of these different frequencies? Um, so then you can like look at, you know, a star that's occluded by some hydrogen helium dust cloud and be able to sort of tell what the cloud does, what it's made of, and also what are the properties of the light uh, coming from our, our distant source. Okay. Yeah, and that, that's, that's what we did. I wrote some code. Okay. I had to switch over to C because Python was too slow, unfortunately. Okay. Right. Um, I was going to ask you about your, your programming languages and, and what you actually use in the real oh, world right. in inverted commas uh, in a bit, but that's yeah, interesting yeah. to hear. Learning C and also learning some Fortran because the code okay. that my honors supervisor had to generate a lot of the properties of Helium that plugged into my code was written in old school Fortran and I needed right. to know how it worked and modify <laughs> it. That was a weird experience. It's like a time machine. <laughs> A time capsule from the 1980s. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. I'd be happy to share some Fortran war stories after this because oh. it's, uh, it's very weird, very yeah. weird language. Okay. Um, yeah. I meant to ask you before we actually started the stream, are you okay to uh, extend past the hour a little bit or do you need to have yeah, a sure. podcast? Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. I don't have to be anywhere for a while after this, so it'll okay. be good. Brilliant. Okay. So uh, let's talk about your PhD then. Um, sure. you did atomic physics and um, yes. and, and more, more of this stuff, which is fascinating. Please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, I it ended up going down to the University of... <coughs> Sorry, let me just grab a bit of water first. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, so I ended up going down to the University of New South Wales in Sydney, which is the big smoke in Australia. Mm -hmm. And did my PhD down there with a guy named Julian Berenguet, who fantastic guy, uh, amazing moustache as well, very important. <laughs> um, and his whole thing was, he's a theoretical physicist in atomic physics, but also before he did his PhD, in between doing a physics degree and a PhD, he went and actually worked as a software engineer in the private sector in London. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, working in like a high frequency trading thing, I think. Uh -huh. maybe. Right. Um, so he actually had a lot of real world experience in writing robust production code, which is somewhat unusual for people from an academic background. Mm -hmm. Typically you'll learn physics and then you'll learn code as you need it. And right. it's a very sort of ad hoc learning process. Whereas Julian had a very, uh, explicit education and that came out in the code that we worked with. It was okay. actually really high production, and he insisted on having a lot of these software engineering practices as distinct from just writing code. He said, you know, mm -hmm. if you're going to commit code to the repository, you know, it has to have comments. Well, I already did that, so that's good. But also, <laughs> it has to be unit tested. Uh, it has to have um, all of this sort of hooking into a lot of our version control systems and sort of very primitive DevOps type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, to make sure it's reliable because in in physics and in science you want your code to be correct right you yeah. don't want to publish wrong answers mm -hmm. uh, it's Definitely. embarrassing but also it's bad for science right people <laughs> might look at your paper and try to do stuff and you know get the wrong results themselves so i i was really interested in atomic physics and really digging down into 
how do we calculate the electronic structure of an atom, those uh, shells that I showed you before? How do we predict those energy levels? How do we predict the transition rates between energy levels um, for really complicated atoms? Because helium was tricky enough, but when I was talking to Julian and I was deciding where to do a PhD, he gave me a demo of his code and it was like magic. It was like getting a demonstration from the 23rd century of the kind of stuff <laughs> he could do. Whereas this really complicated atoms with lots of electrons and you know really gnarly open shell configurations and was able to get really good accuracy that I didn't even think it was possible. I was like, I need to work on this. This is like tickled something in the back of my brain okay. to work on this. And I really dove into the theory of um, how can we do super duper high precision atomic calculations? And then how can we use those to do or to guide interesting physics? So the one in my honors project uh, was very heavily theoretical. Uh, it was you know, not really in conjunction with experimentalists, mm -hmm. but in my PhD thesis, we worked quite closely with a number of experimental groups in Europe to basically guide a lot of their experiments. We wanted to be able to do calculations to say, if you drive this particular transition in an atom, you should see it occur at this frequency and have, you know, this particular characteristic, um, you know, line width and decay rates when your atom gets excited. So then they can go and do the experiment and not waste a bunch of time sort of fumbling around in the dark. Yeah. So it was quite satisfying in that regard. So, sorry, if I may um, expand on that slightly, D does the simulation then sort of give the research researchers doing the experimentation, does it, does it give them sort of a, a direction to look in and a point to look which they would otherwise have to be guessing and so it can absolutely help. okay absolutely so to give a concrete example uh, a couple of papers that i wrote towards the end of my phd in collaboration with uh, some other computational physicists we work with and some experimentalists in germany we were interested in doing a study of the spectrum of lorentium which is a super heavy element Mm -hmm. So that's Z equals 103. It's right to the bottom of the periodic table. It's mm -hmm. a highly, highly radioactive element. It's got a, um, a sort of average half-life of its longest lived isotope on the order of, I think, milliseconds or something. <laughs> okay. And it's really hard to produce. Uh, right. the, the best labs in the world produce it at the rate of something crazy, like one atom per minute. No. Really quickly. <laughs> okay. So you can't waste a bunch of time floating around in the dark. And also, like, nobody had made this in substantial quantities before. Right. And, like, we still haven't. Um, so you've got, like, you have to do uh, theory to sort of get an idea of how it's going to behave. You can't just kind of, like, make it and see what it does and poke it and prod it and try a bunch of stuff because it'll decay before you finished it. That's fascinating. That's not not what I was expecting, but that's really interesting still. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I mean, yeah. there's no practical application to that stuff. It's just because it's it's there and because it's I, interesting. And I love things work. like that, which they exist. We can prove they exist, but they barely exist. You know, it's just like yeah. almost like if you blinked, you, you wouldn't know it exists kind of thing. <laughs> yep. And like Sorry. the only time it exists in nature is potentially for like microseconds in a supernova <laughs> yes. before it decays down into something else. Very extreme oh, physics. Awesome stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Sorry. it was, yeah, back, no, it's back. all good. It's all good. Back Happy to, your, to do um, tangents. Your, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We, we were writing a lot of code um, to get this stuff to improve the accuracy, but also to improve the accuracy, we needed to go bigger. And to do bigger calculations, you know, extend that sum to more and more terms. And of course, that gets quite expensive. It's um, if you're familiar with like algorithmic scaling from computer science, computer science, configuration like interaction. Bigger notation, is that what we're talking about? Bigger notation, exactly. Yeah. Okay. The algorithm that we are using called configuration interaction is something like a, God, I think it's like a n to the seven or something. It's uh, very different from linear scaling. Right. So those numbers will kill you if you <laughs> don't do something about it. Okay. We have to run and it on supercomputers. I was going to say, is, is the solution to this bigger computers or is it really, really spend a lot of time writing the software carefully, optimizing and things? You know, how do you deal with well, that? Well, in order to use the bigger computers, you have to write the software to take advantage of it. 
Yeah. So like okay. a supercomputer is not just like your normal desktop, but faster. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of what we call nodes, which are like self-contained, uh, like little blade servers, basically self-contained computers with their own memory and their own network interconnect and CPUs. And those are all linked with a really fast, like high speed network. And so what you need to do to use it, if you just run on a single core, it'll actually usually be slower than running on your computer because mm -hmm. they pick lower frequency, like lower clock speed cores on a cluster just for like power consumption reasons, because you've got crap loads of these things. Mm -hmm. You don't want it to physically melt if you're running it, you know, overclocked. So you need to be able to split your calculation up across lots of different uh, units. So you can think of if you're calculating like elements of a matrix, you might take each element of that matrix and you say, okay, this matrix, I give it to this process over here, this element. And this other element goes to this process over here and here. And you divide it up across all of the nodes in your supercomputer. You get them to calculate their results. And then at the end, you collect them all back together into some final answer. So your code has to be specifically written to take advantage of that. Okay. And that's the only way that a lot of these things are tractable. Right. But scaling is difficult, right? Because you've got a lot of overheads. As anyone who's worked in any kind of like large scale web app stuff can tell you, latency is a big deal. Latency mm -hmm. will kill you. Bandwidth is finite. Um, you've got this thing in uh, high performance computing. I'm not sure how well it's known outside of this, but in parallel computing specifically, it's called Amdahl's law. And it says that if you've got an uh, a application where some proportion of the work that it does can be parallelized and some proportion of it is inherently serial, mm -hmm. you are limited in the amount of speed up you can get by throwing more processes at it. It will eventually level off as the execution time gets dominated by your serial fraction. Right. A parallel fraction gets a smaller and smaller amount of time, but the serial fraction is unchanged. Yep. So. Once you get to that scaling limit where you don't get any benefit from adding more processes to it, you then have to go back and refactor your algorithm and your code to try and hunt down these serial bits and reduce it as you go. <laughs> and if you can get 99% of your code parallel and 1% serial, that's very good. Okay. But that still limits your scaling to you know some finite amount. So really yeah. you want to be shooting for like 99.9, 99.99% okay. parallelizable. So you, you, you say that. you say 99 and is very good and you want to be aiming for 99.9, .9, et cetera. What is yeah. typical of an application like this? Are we uh, talking that, you know, people maybe manage 95% or, you know, what are we looking at? Or is that not, yes. not something you can give a good sort of broad uh, overview of? Geez, this is probably going to be very rough shooting from the hip. So, sure. you know, don't quote me on this. No, but no, that's okay. I think for the code that we were working on called Ambit, we got something like a 98% parallel uh, thing once I was okay. done sort of doing all these optimizations with it and splitting up the parallel workload. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty good. Um, and I think, yeah, typically for like the big production scientific codes that have lots and lots of people working on them across multiple institutions, then you're sort of looking at 99 or higher percent efficiency. Okay. It is but really it's very high. hard. That's, that's, yeah, very cool. I was expecting you to say that it was 99 was like the ideal or, or the, the target and actually, you know, 90% or sort of maybe even lower is, is what people normally achieve because actually there's this problem where you can't, you you can't always uh, paralyze things. It depends on the um depends on the algorithm as well. Like Absolutely, some algorithms yeah, yeah. are much harder to to split like that, and some are yeah. much easier. Okay. Um, so okay. like, yeah, it it just varies on the code. I've okay. seen some yeah. that are much lower, and sometimes that's because that's just it is what it is. You got to eat it, and sometimes it's because it was written by someone who had a very deep knowledge of the physics, for example. Mm -hmm. but maybe not so much of like how to squeeze all the juice out of the parallel stuff, which is okay. fine. They're different skill sets. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's why they get someone like me to come along and try and, you know, really squeeze everything they can out of it. <laughs> Very cool. I think we'll talk more about the HPC side of things in a bit. Sure. But, uh, yeah, thank you for that one. Um, I think you, you mentioned um, before we, we started the stream about a piece of software you wrote for your PhD that uh, you co-authored a paper on and was possibly the best piece of software for this application. Can you talk to us about that for a bit? Sure. Um, this code was called Ambit, 
Um, okay. It doesn't stand for anything. It's just a cool sounding name. Um, <laughs> right? My super Julian's brother was, uh, I think he worked in marketing at the time. So they kind of did like a whiteboard <laughs> session to come up with a cool name and you want your name to be Google unique as well um, right. so that people can find it mm -hmm. and you want it to be memorable. So Ambit, um, and it was this atomic many body code that Julian started working on during his PhD. So back in like 2006, and it had been mostly chugging along in house, uh, only being used by members of that group at UNSW. But um, as I started making modifications to it, mostly around parallel scaling to just be able to push it further and further along and do bigger and bigger physics. Um, we started thinking that like, okay, we're getting some really good results out of this. It'd be awesome if we could open source this so that other people can use it. And the real sort of differentiating factor we found is that it was written in modern C++. It had really nice user experience and user input. I spent a lot of time making sure that, you know, a just basic stuff like documentation was there, but that it was really easy to build. I had like a nice build system that eh, hasn't aged so well in hindsight, but at the right. time it was great. Um, and all of these nice sort of things so that someone who doesn't know very much about computers can kind of clone the Git repo, compile it on their cluster with, you know, some basic flags to get some parallelism and then take you know, the system they want to calculate, which is not turnkey, you do need to know some atomic physics, mm -hmm. but ideally not knowing anything about how the code works behind the scene. You can specify your system, compile it, hit go, and get good results pretty much that, there you go, one and done, more or less. Um, and that is a niche that was not filled at the time in atomic physics. A lot of the code was really hard to use, it was really hard to compile, some of it, you know, you it was not publicly available. You had to email the professor who wrote it. And they would send you like a zip file with a zip bunch file, of yeah. <laughs> One thing that I had to deal with at one point didn't even have a build system, little, okay. like not even a make file, let alone something nice like oh, CMake. So you had to reverse engineer how to compile the damn thing. And it was a nightmare. So a user-friendly code was like, yeah, this needs to happen. Let's open source this. Yeah. So we, we started writing a paper on it. Um, because in academia, we'll get into this a little bit later if we've got time, hopefully, mm -hmm. but in academia, typically the way you get advanced in your career is by writing papers and getting citations. Right. And software per se is not yet very well rewarded in an academic career path, which means that uh, in order to get any credit for stuff, you have to publish a paper on the software, then release the software and tell people, if you use this software to do calculations, please cite this paper that we wrote. Right. So then we can get citation metrics. Interesting. And, okay. Yeah. So we wrote this paper and released it. Um, and that was a great experience in just like community management, dealing with support tickets from people from <laughs> all across the world and uh, then going and spooking it, like, you know, traveling to different universities and saying, here's the code. Let me give you a tutorial on how to use it. Okay. Here's how it can work for you. And, uh, yeah, one of two of the things that I think were great, uh, great signs about this is that we, as part of the the paper, had to do a benchmark to basically show this code does what we think it does. Mm -hmm. So we measured, we we calculated the spectrum, the energy levels of um, <clears throat> uh, an ion called chromium plus, which is quite a tricky one. It's where you know where your chrome for cars and stuff comes from. Okay, and I picked it purely because it's a hard system to calculate. And it turns out that the benchmarks that we did for the paper was at that time the most accurate calculations that anyone had done for the spectrum hey. of chromium plus. Pat yourself on the head. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty good. And then later on, uh, in this paper for the super heavy elements for Lorentzian, we were collaborating with another uh, computational focused academic in the Netherlands, and she had some really whiz bang code that was, you know, state of the art for molecular science and definitely state of the art for atomic science. And what we all thought was this code will give better accuracy for the simple systems than Ambit will because it's designed to deal with like 
atoms that have one and two sort of valence electrons. So, you know, outside of your, the, the electrons that can do your sort of jumpy jumps. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got, you know, <laughs> two of those. And this code yeah. was designed to deal with those and to be really good at it. Whereas right. our code is more for when you've got much more complicated structures where you've got lots of electrons. And the more electrons you have, the more complicated it gets. Okay. Um, but the thing that we found is that our code actually just by using these clever tricks that we had built into it, both of physics and numerical stuff, and also being able to scale it out to like, you know, a thousand CPU cores meant that we got basically comparable accuracy to this other state of the art code, which was like a great sign that like, we didn't think we could do this, but yeah. we actually got really great accuracy and we got more quantities that that code couldn't calculate. Awesome. So, I don't know. It's probably going to get me some anger from people who maintain other atomic physics codes. There's always some rivalry here. But I think at the time that I finished my PhD, AMBIT was probably the best in the world for doing that kind of atomic structure calculations. That's brilliant. Well done. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I guess, was... I guess having, having sort of compared it with that other piece of software you mentioned just now, you also get confidence in your results as well, not just that, yeah. um, you know, you are you're keeping up with them effectively, but you're also um, checking each other's work. Is that the right way to phrase it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we make sure that's, we that's get brilliant. the right answer. Yeah, fantastic. Cool. Yeah, so you know, that was a very fun experience. And I ended up you know, discovering that I really like writing code. I like doing yeah. this sort of performance analysis, translating equations into you know, code, and tried to find some way that I could keep doing that uh, and a traditional academic career path is not great for that. It doesn't mm -hmm. do a fantastic job of incentivizing software development. Like I said, the incentives are writing papers mm -hmm. and not writing code, which means that at best developing the software, even though it's really important, has to be like a side activity, right? right. You can't spend too much time on it because it doesn't directly advance your career the same yeah. way that writing papers and doing calculations and stuff does. That sure. was kind of a bummer to discover. But um, fortunately, I was able to, uh, I, I had a, a chat with my current boss just to meet up and be like, hey, you do cool science, let's talk. I'd like to talk about computational chemistry uh, as much as computational physics. And she was hiring a position that was purely a scientific program, a research software engineer is the sort of term of art now, mm -hmm. but it was purely a position to write code. Okay. And that's quite rare because you need to convince the funding agencies that this is a better use of money than just hiring another postdoc to crank out papers. <laughs> and fortunately, my boss is the real deal. She's uh, you know, a very distinguished academic in this field and was able to say, you know, she got a, a very um, sort of prestigious uh, and high value grant. It's a Australian Laureate Fellowship mm -hmm. that comes with a lot of money attached to it. And she was able to say, I want to set aside money to have someone to write code for me and do this sort of software engineering. And the funding agency, the Australian Research Council said yes. And so she was able to hire for this position. And she said, look, if you want to apply for it, go ahead, but also be aware that this will probably close off doing a more traditional academic career path because you won't be publishing papers, you won't be teaching courses or doing that right. sort of stuff. So it was definitely one of those like, once you do this, you kind of can't go yeah, back. Yeah, fork in the roads. Fork and so road, yeah. I, I presume correctly then that you took this fork and you you did it? I did. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. yeah. I, uh, I applied happy with, for the job. Happy with the decision? You haven't looked back on it too much? No, I don't regret it at all. It's, uh, it's pretty much a perfect fit for what I want to do. Um, awesome. And it, it was a bit of an adjustment um, getting into more of a support role because mm -hmm. when I was a PhD student, I was both learning like an apprenticeship, but also... I got to set a lot of the directions of like what I wanted to do as well. Right. Whereas here, it's a lot more like a traditional software engineering role where you have sort of stakeholders, I guess, which are other academics in the research group. And they might say, I'm working on this particular problem. Can you write some code that will solve it for me? Mm -hmm. So there's some leeway to explore things on my own, but it has to ultimately be tethered to what are these people need? Someone else's need. Yeah. yeah. Yes. On a brass tax and how do you support that okay yeah very interesting yeah. can you talk to us a bit about what you're doing day to day then in this in this role sure um so right now my job title is scientific programmer 
and it's sort of split a little bit between sort of three prongs. One of them is software development, so actually writing code and testing it and optimizing it and making sure that it's correct and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. One of them is the, I guess, sort of like operations side of deploying code to the high performance computing clusters that we use. So getting it to compile, which is often more difficult than it might sound because some of this code is quite opinionated. It might be quite <laughs> old. The clusters have kind of weird environments. So it's, you know, it requires a bit of a bit of art to get it mm -hmm. to build and then to tweak it so that it works well on that particular computing system. They all have different software libraries, different network uh, fabrics and right. network libraries and stuff. So you need a little bit of tweaking because what might work well on one cluster might not work well on another. I was, let's, let's save the talk of HPC for, for a bit, I think, but I've got lots right. of questions around that topic. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> Sorry, kind of on. hard because that's what my role revolves around. I'm, I'm biting so my tongue a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the last one is, is user support. A large part okay. of my role as well is writing documentation um, and training up new users. Often when we get new PhD students come in or even new postdocs, they might not have had much experience in using supercomputers at the scale that we do. Uh, often if they're new to a PhD or doing an honors project themselves, this might be their first time using things like a command line interface. Mm -hmm. You know, all throughout their university degree, they've used Windows or Mac or something, and now they have to SSH into a headless cluster that <laughs> runs Linux. And it's all like, oh my God, what do I do? What, how do I get it to do things? What does any of this mean? And so there needs to be a lot of like onboarding of like, okay, here's how you do stuff. Here's some tutorials I wrote. Here's some YouTube videos that people have done, colleagues have done. And sort of if they then have questions like, hey, the code's crashing, you know, what do you do? If they can't figure it out themselves, then, you know, I have to sort of step in and try and figure out like, why is this breaking? That's really so that's the sort of three prongs of what I do day to day. Yeah. And so um, in terms of, I guess, that support, it's more um, helping people run the, 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 the software on the clusters. It's not maintaining and operating the clusters. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Maintaining the clusters in like a sort of system administrator role is right. very difficult. It's not the sort of thing you can do as a side gig okay. or a sort of 20% project. Right, right. Um, and I suppose I can put a pin in that for when we come back to high performance computing. But the reason <laughs> sure. why it's hard is intrinsically tied into how high performance computing works okay. and how yeah, it's different awesome. for a lot of stuff. Cool. Okay. Very good. So um, in terms of then the software that you're writing day to day, is that... Is that open source? Is that all closed source? You know, where does that sit in the world and and how does that, I guess, come to being? Is it some someone says, I need to solve this problem and then you have to figure out what the problem is and how to solve it? You know, is that yeah. kind of where we're sitting? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the oftentimes you'll get something that's a really simple, like I just need to, there's an, an integral that my sort of maths has taken me to and I can't solve that by hand can you write a little Python script that will numerically integrate, basically figure out the area under some complicated curve. Okay. And that's like a really short one and done project. That'll be like a once off. I write the code, calculate the integral, give it to the user. Yeah. And then you never think about it again, because it's just a, <laughs> the equivalent of a little shell script to do something, yes. right? Yeah. But there's more complicated stuff out there that uh, some of it that we work with has its genesis in our group and that's not publicly available yet question mark mm -hmm. it's not clear if we want to make it publicly available okay. or if there's any benefit because one of the big projects that i'm doing right now is trying to get a lot of the novel physics and the sort of really new computational methods and uh sort of physical processes that are quite difficult to simulate uh that are built into this code that people, my predecessors in this group have written over many, many years uh, and put those into more widely used code. So my philosophy on a lot of this stuff is that you need to meet users, in this case, scientists, where they are. Mm -hmm. And there is a higher return on investment to if there is some software that is already very widely used 
to build features into that open source software so that it's available to a lot of people than to write your own code and try to convince everyone to use it. Mm -hmm. That's the basic reasoning here. Okay. So we're kind of trying to take stuff that exists in our in-house code that is currently closed source uh, and put it into more fully featured uh, and more commonly used code bases. So then it's it's got a wider reach than it would if we just open sourced everything from the yeah, start. Yeah, interesting. I suppose I should take a step back. I think I haven't actually told what science we do in the current oh, group. Oh, please yet. do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it, it is it is somewhat different from the atomic physics that I was doing in that we are a okay. molecular science group. So it's like computational chemistry almost, right. trying to model chemical reactions and interesting materials and materials process um, at the sort of molecular level. So you've got some novel material that might be like some, I don't know, graphene sheet or something, and you want to pass an electric current through it. We have simulations using what's called molecular dynamics to try and model how do the atoms in this system move around under time. And when you kind of apply some uh, process to them, it might be an electric potential. It might be you've got some fluid flow, like you're forcing flow through a tube. How does this uh, change the system? And how does this impact things like chemical reactions, physical reactions? Can we get little materials that kind of like clump together under flow to form interesting little nanostructures that are, are worth looking at? So okay. it's very much on the much more applied. And our two sort of big fields of research that we work in um, at, back at the University of Queensland, in this case, uh, AIBN, is battery technology trying to find better materials to build batteries and better ways to sort of design using those materials and also molecular fluid flow processes. So things like desalination is kind of the, the okay. big application for that. You know, we want to make more robust and cheaper desalination filters than the typical ones. How can we model you know, what actually happens at the molecular level if we have some sheet with some holes in it and we're forcing water through it that's got salt in it. When we change certain parameters, how does that change how much salt comes through versus stays at the other side? And so by parameters, you're talking about maybe the size of the holes and the shape of the holes and yeah, the thickness of the sheet, that kind of thing. Is that right? Yeah, or... the stuff it's made of. Yeah? Do we okay. make it out of, you know, one material carbon versus carbon with some oxygens on it? Okay. Uh, shape, a really interesting shape that one of our honors students was looking at was this idea that you have a tube, so like a carbon nanotube, which, uh, you know, basically a little sort of lattice that sort of forms a, cylind a hollow cylinder made out mm -hmm. of carbon atoms. You have some holes in it and you have some water that's got salt in the middle and you spin it and <laughs> the salt behaves differently under the spinniness than the water does. And so through this spinning process, stuff comes out the pores and you end up with clean water left at the end. Wow. So okay. looking at like what ratio of filtration do you get? Is this even energy efficient? Like, yeah. is this worth doing? Is it just a cool idea or can we do something with it? And so is this, um, is this sort of the, the theoretical stuff, which then feeds into potential prototypes and real world applications by someone else or yeah. you know, where do you sit in that process? Yeah, exactly. So we sort of work more on the side of, to give an idea with batteries, right? We want yeah. to obviously design new battery technologies to replace lithium ion batteries because they have some limitations for say grid scale, grid scale storage. Mm -hmm. They don't hold the charge for as long. They don't have as much uh, power density or char uh, current density as we want. Um, energy density, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but the space of possible materials you can make it from is huge. There's okay. so many different things you can tweak, so many different, what if we add a couple of extra atoms here? What if we use sulfur for this instead of carbon? What if we use sulfur and carbon? What if we make it out of, you know, weird crinkly shaped electrodes rather than flat electrodes? And it's just not feasible for an experimental group to run and build a prototype for every single one of these Physical possible things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because most of them won't work, right? Just that's kind of, that's life. Most yeah. of them won't work. So it's better if we can run the computer simulations and we can say, nope, that one's a dud. Don't waste your time with that. 
This awesome. one looks good. Give this one a try. Pass it off to people in a lab who can then build it and test it and see if okay. it works. And is that a two-way street? Do they do they sort of chemistry people who know about batteries and making batteries say, we, we can't achieve that, but can you tweak these electrodes to this sort of dimensions maybe, and then you rerun yeah. it? And... Okay. Yeah, exactly. What would happen if we did this? Or sometimes it's things like this device is doing something and we don't understand why it's doing this. Can you do a simulation so we can get an idea of what's going Amazing. on at the molecular level yeah. and maybe get some insight into what it's doing and why it's doing the weird stuff? That's so, so it good. is very much a yeah. two-way street. Fantastic. And it's a very, very satisfying environment to work in because some of our collaborators are in the same building as us. Okay. And some of them are, you know, spread across different universities throughout Australia yeah. and elsewhere. Um, but it's it's very much a, I guess the buzzword is multidisciplinary. Yeah. But we're trying to build these very practical, uh, very sort of rough and ready stuff to get it out into the world. And that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a different kind of satisfying than trying to elucidate the fundamental laws of nature. Both yep. are good, both have their place, but yes. they're different kinds of stuff. Yeah, 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 definitely. Can we talk about HPC now? <laughs> yes, finally, we've been teasing so... it the whole interview, yeah. <laughs> so so um, let's just start off with your relationship to a high performance compute cluster, could we? Um, is sure. it something that the university owns or AIBN directly or, or, or similar? Yeah, there's multiple tiers that we have access to. Okay. So my university owns and operates a sort of big-ish cluster. Uh, and part of the fun with high-performance computing is all of the clusters have different names and okay. can tell a lot about the institution by what name they give them. <laughs> so UQ's cluster is called Bunya after a, uh, a type of plant in Australia, the Bunya pine, okay. which has these huge nuts that like cluster together and almost like giant pine cones. Oh, and okay. we're talking like as big as your head. So if one of them falls on you, it can kill you. Wow, okay. <laughs> and it's it's native to the east coast of, of Australia. Okay. Um, and Bunya is a sort of big-ish cluster. It's got like, I don't know, let's say a couple of hundred nodes and uh, some GPUs. And then we also have access through some national allocation schemes that are merit-based. You basically have to write a grant application and say, this is the science we want to do. These are the resources we'll need. Here is proof that we know what we're doing and we won't mm -hmm. waste the compute time. And then we can get access to the national facilities that are sort of shared between everyone in Australia. Okay. There's two of those. One is in uh, our capital city, Canberra, on the East Coast. And that is a cluster called Gadi. And the other one is on the west coast of Australia in Perth called Cetonix, which is relatively new. It's still in the sort of build out deployment phase. But when it gets built, it'll be a real beast of a machine. And we have we have access to all of those. And we kind of have to part of my job as well is making sure that you know, we get a quota on each of these that we're allowed mm -hmm. to use, a certain number of CPU hours or compute hours that we can okay. do. We need to make sure that, like, we don't run out of it halfway through a quarter and then we scheduling can't do any. And, yeah. Anymore. So um, can we talk about scheduling on a, on a cluster? Yeah. Because like that's probably in its, you know, its own problem. I, um, I imagine you kind of get, uh, like, a, a diary... A, like entry that says it becomes yours from this time to that time. And yeah. you then have to get in, install all of your stuff, potentially set it all up, get it ready, run your, your thing. And then hopefully you don't run out of time before it's finished. Is that kind of like realistic or, sort of or half right? Yeah. Okay. So your everything up to the installing time, installing stuff uh, during your time slot is correct. Okay. So, when you're running actual compute jobs, the number crunching stuff, mm -hmm. um, that is a time sharing type approach. So you make a request with the job scheduler. Uh, it's it's a shell script with some extra semantic sugar, uh, syntactic sugar on top. And you say, I want this many CPU cores, or maybe I want this many GPUs, this much memory across this many nodes for this amount of time, like let's say I want 64 cores and 100 gigabytes of memory for two hours. And then the rest of your shell script is the commands that you want to execute. 
and the then you submit that to the scheduler and it finds some spot in the queue where it can fit you okay and that spot is based on what resources are available at the time as well as things like uh, many clusters will use what's called a fair share allocation so if you've used a ton of compute time this quarter then towards the end of the quarter your jobs will get put further back in the queue to make space for people who haven't used the cluster very much mm -hmm. so far it's to ensure that one group doesn't hog the whole thing yeah, uh, sure. for the whole the whole time but once it finds a spot where it can fit your job then it'll just like sit it in the queue and you don't touch it from that point on you okay. can query the status of it and the scheduler will say yep it's due to run at sometimes it'll be 2 a.m on thursday or something right. like that and you just have to hope or you know be sure that it won't crash <laughs> in <sure>. that time <laughs> Yeah, like so, ideally what you want to do is test it on smaller things that you can run faster and then you scale it up for the right. big ones so, once you know so, it works. So, you know, a cluster is is a large number of nodes, right? Do you have yes. a small number of nodes that you can run it on for real that doesn't cost what it does to run it on the real cluster, but sort of prove that your binaries are compiled correctly and they're actually going to work effectively before your scheduled slot? Yeah, okay. we do. Um, so the main, actually the main function that uh, UQ's cluster sort of has, uh, I, I don't know if main function is the right word, but the main way that we <laughs> use it is we don't get, uh, we don't have a, a fixed quota for that. We can use as much as we want within the fair sharing allocation. So the mm -hmm. more we use, the lower priority our jobs will be, but also uh, as part of this uh, fellowship grant that funds my salary, it also came with some money for compute resources, so we bought some nodes on that cluster. Okay. So instead of buying our own cluster, we basically put money into a pool, and that got built in this data center as part of the overall bunya. But they're like they're ours, so we get special priority on that. So typically, you get, what you get priority, or they are yours all the time to use and do what you like with. We have it set up so that we have priority, so that okay. our jobs will always or almost always run but like other people can use it just right. at a lower priority. Very and um, you can set it up other ways. So mm -hmm. down at UNSW during my PhD, my PhD supervisor had also bought nodes for a HPC cluster uh, that UNSW owned. And this is a pretty typical model of co-investment. You don't want to run the compute servers yourself as an academic. You kind of, it's almost like how you would do like cloud computing, I guess. You mm -hmm. pay for some nodes and then you let the IT guys administer it Figure and it do yeah. all the sysadmin stuff and handle the cooling and the power distribution and that sort of stuff but we had exclusive access to that so we could we could only run jobs on those nodes mm -hmm. but we were the only ones who could use it right so it was like having our own little private cluster okay so we typically make sure jobs run on bunya first and have good parallel efficiency and then we can sort of transplant it over to one of the others run some small jobs there mm -hmm. that are um you know, they have a quota, they eat into the quota, but hopefully they're relatively small, so it's not that expensive to check that it works. Right. Then you scale it up. Okay. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, I'd always, again, this is probably just misconceptions and not thinking about it hard enough, but I'd always presumed that the cluster was a thing and you got all of it or no, none of it. You know, when you are running your thing on, on the cluster, you occupy the whole thing. Um, but it sounds like no. that's not true. And it sounds like no. potentially as well, multiple multiple programs can run like at the same time in different places on the cluster correct it's a okay. it's very much a shared tenancy yeah. um, approach most compute jobs simply aren't big enough to make use of the whole cluster at once right. many of the leadership class clusters um they might have some program where you can request ahead of time i want like half the cluster and that's like a big allocation. So you need to work <laughs> out ahead of time to fit it. Um, and those are quite hard to get a hands on. And you have to prove that you can actually make use of that much stuff before they right. let you do it. Okay. And typically they will run for benchmarking stuff before they make it available for the whole uh, user base. They'll take some code and they'll just like chuck it on the whole cluster and just like give it a whirl and see if it can actually do that. <laughs> But um, <laughs> us mere mortals don't typically get to do that, no. <laughs> which is a shame. I did have one fun experience during my PhD. Um, there was this old architecture 
uh, CPU architecture that Intel came out with years ago called the Xeon Phi. Mm -hmm. It's like the Knight's Landing, Knight's Corner type chips. And that was going to be their like GPU killer. That was how they were going to compete with <laughs> yeah. pardon me, uh, NVIDIA. And it was a really weird architecture. And I kind of love it, even though it was kind of bad. Uh, or at least badly executed, I have a soft spot in my heart for it because it had a lot of interesting ideas that yeah. were had some problems in the execution, but also were kind of just a little bit too early. Like the okay. technology wasn't quite ready for these ideas. Um, and I collect old and obsolete computer manuals just for fun. I have a whole bunch of books I got from uh, Bromley on those that I borrowed and then didn't give back. And I was like, oh, hey, do you want these back? And he's like, no, nah, you keep them. It's all good. Because the Xeon awesome. Pi is now obsolete. Like, yes. you can buy them on the secondhand market, but very, very few places still have them. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, they were kind of the new hotness. And right. NCI, the cluster down in Canberra, uh, the facility down in Canberra, their previous cluster, Raijin, had a set of Xeon Phi nodes that they had bought as like a, this seems cool. Let's buy mm -hmm. them, give them a try, see if our users like them. Theoretically, easier to get code running on that because it's all x86 architecture. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to rewrite it in CUDA or whatever to get it to run. You do need multi, you know, multi-threading and multi-processing. But you know, in theory, it should be easier to get your codes to get good parallelism on these things. They've got like, you know, 64 cores, 256 hardware threads. So I think you've got what does that work out to? That's four-way hyper-threading, basically. Crazy, uh, which is yeah. quite unusual. This like high bandwidth memory. So you've got some yeah, discrete yeah. chunk of memory that's really high bandwidth and it's user controllable. So you can set up whether you want to have it as separately addressable scratch space or to use it as like a hardware controlled cache or just unify the memory. So it's just kind of let the, the runtime do what it wants with it. Okay. Stuff that if you've ever worked with a GPU, these might be very familiar concepts, right? Mm -hmm except it's on x86 hardware. Yeah. Unfortunately, because you've got so many threads and you've got such wide vector widths and you've got to be really careful about memory movement at this scale, it ends up being basically as hard to program as a GPU. <laughs> so at that point, you might as well just rewrite your code in CUDA. OK. So in practice, hardly anybody used them. But I actually spent some time in my PhD getting Ambit to run on Xeon Phi is making a, a fork of that. Okay. And at the time, there was nobody else using the Xeon Phi's on <laughs> Raijin. So I just had them all to myself. I was just like, cool, I'm just going <laughs> to, for funsies, run a job using like all five of these. And it's just like, ah, oh, the power. That's amazing. <laughs> it was so much fun. Very cool. Yeah. So That's I guess with H HPC. Um, yeah. The other big thing that's really coming through the um, the pipeline uh, and has been for a long time, but is now just inescapable, is GPU programming. You could talk a little bit about, about that this. if you'd like. Yeah, because that's you know, so. You know, if you, I was actually going to ask a more generic question about HPC, was sure. that pr potentially they could be very um, custom and different one cluster to another, mm. and so you'd have to sort of take. A lot of care in getting your application to run properly and efficiently on each one. Yes, is that is that kind of true? Um, and and does does GPU complicate that even further? Then it sure does. Oh boy! <laughs> so sometimes even getting the code to compile is tricky. Okay. Scientific code is very much a uh, an interesting field because there's a lot of stuff that is quite old. It's kind of like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. And it's quite tricky to get a lot of this numerical algorithms right. So once you have something that works, you kind of don't want to touch it, right? right? It's sort of like we make some tweaks here and there, but ultimately it does the job. Uh, and this gets back to that idea that, you know, scientists aren't incentivized to write software. They're incentivized to do science. And that's mm -hmm. good. That's what they should be doing. But it means that often if you, once you have code that works, it kind of like gets stuck and frozen in amber. So there's a lot of code that, for example, is written in old Fortran, but it will only compile with like the Intel Fortran compiler or mm -hmm. the Cray Fortran compiler or this one version of GCC from 10 years ago. <laughs> and getting that to build is tricky, but also the clusters, you know, each HPC cluster is often tailor-built for the kind of workloads that the center expects them to have. 
Mm -hmm. And so you want to sort of design your software stack and your hardware stack, especially for that, which means they'll all have different communications libraries for doing networking between nodes. They might have different available compilers. Uh, they might even have different available um, operating systems. That rarely makes a difference, but sometimes it does. Mm -hmm. And so there are, it's usually fine to just like get the code to compile and then run it. But if you want to get the most performance possible, you need to dive into these different sort of tweaks. Scientific libraries are another big one. You know, Intel has their own proprietary code for doing linear algebra or, you know, matrix multiplication. Um, fast Fourier transforms, that sort of stuff. And it works really well on Intel hardware, mm. not so much on anything else. So yep. if you've got an AMD cluster, you need to find which ones will work well on AMD CPUs <laughs> and so on and so forth. Okay. And GPUs are even harder because that space is really, really fragmented right now. And a lot of the stuff is deeply proprietary and there's a ton of vendor lock-in. Mm -hmm. So even writing code that will work across different GPUs is quite hard. NVIDIA is currently the big game in town with GPUs, and they write, they have their own language, CUDA, that only runs on NVIDIA GPUs. Yep. So if you write it in CUDA, it'll work on NVIDIA, but not on AMD and not on Intel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, AMD has their own open standard that's essentially a re-implementation of the CUDA API called HIP, and that can compile for AMD GPUs or NVIDIA, but not for Intel. And mm -hmm. Intel is putting all their money in this other framework called Sickle, that can theoretically do all of them, but it's much less mature and like <laughs> nobody coordinates with each other. Right. So they're my all competing job is kind to be of, the best. Yeah, you know, like, exactly. Don't exactly. cheat from me, kind of thing. <laughs> yes, we don't. We want to get vendor lock in. Everyone wants to get that walled <laughs> garden because if you've got code written in CUDA, it's a pain in the butt to get it to run on other stuff. So right. you might just not bother, and you might just tell your IT department. No, just buy an NVIDIA cluster. Yeah, you know, exactly. I can't be bothered to get it to work. So uh, it's, it's good if you can get it, but it's bad for the field. Yeah. So yeah, the, the job I'm doing at the moment, uh, I actually sort of just last week got some nasty GPU bugs finally fixed, okay. is getting this code I was telling you about in the open source molecular dynamics code base ported to this framework that's being developed out of the Department of Energy in the US that is supposed to be a multi-GPU cross-vendor framework where you express your parallel algorithm in C++ using templates uh, and other sort of C++ tools for polymorphism. Then at compile time, you specify which backend you want to compile for. Do I want NVIDIA? Do I want AMD? Do I want to run wow. it on the CPU okay. with multi-threading? And the compiler crunches through all of this stuff, and then it generates the device-specific code. So Magic at the end, happens. you only have to yeah. write it is magic, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you only have to write one code base that you can then recompile to work on all of these things with no hassle. Yeah. Okay. And it's a very, very nice tool called Cocos. And the downside is because it's trying to do something intrinsically complicated and it's making use of C++ templates, which are kind mm -hmm. of notoriously gnarly. <laughs> you've got these like nested template patterns and like variadic template patterns. When stuff goes wrong, you can have a hard time figuring out what's gone wrong. Yeah. You get these like, you know, 40 line long error <laughs> messages in the terminal or this because that, email. because that, et cetera. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like where in this suite of template <laughs> parameters is the problem? And they've got some tools to deal with it, but the compiler errors are like an unavoidable problem of using right. templates in C++. Yeah. So it's, there's always yeah. trade-offs, right? Fair enough. But once you get it done, it's just like crazy fast. You know, GPUs, yeah. their whole thing, they're a kind of special purpose hardware. They're designed, you can't run like a web browser on a CPU, massively but they'll crunch parallel. a whole bunch of numbers and massively parallel. Yeah. So for the kind of stuff that we do, it's great. You can get huge speed ups. And if you can do multi GPUs, you can just blast it. You can just throw like a billion atoms at it and it'll just <laughs> chew through it. <laughs> and um, it's, it's so satisfying. <laughs> and it means we can tackle these huge systems that would be completely inaccessible otherwise. Mm. Yeah. Very cool. I think um, yeah. you've just mentioned, um, you know, running these and, and potentially the output. Can we can we see a little bit of um, sort of demos? I think you had lined up of sure the molecular dynamics stuff that we're talking about. Yeah. Let me just run over and share my screen and I'll show sure. you. All right. 
Ready. So, all right. What are we looking at here so, then? This is a little widget that I made as a teaching tool to help teach students and get them a bit of a, an intuition for molecular dynamics and how mm -hmm. these sorts of molecular simulations work. Very much in the spirit of the stuff that I was talking about earlier with pencil and paper, except this time you can get pictures. Mm -hmm. So this is a simulation of a bunch of atoms. Um, they use a, a sort of approximate potential that kind of roughly corresponds to something like a noble gas like argon. Um, so you can kind of benchmark it against real stuff, but it's very much like a toy model or a test model. Okay. Uh, there's no molecular bonding. There's no molecular geometry. They're all just kind of point particles with some interaction. But it's really, really quick to calculate, and I can run stuff in real time on my computer. So in this window here on the left where my mouse is, we've mm -hmm. got the individual atoms, and they're sitting in a nice crystalline lattice that we've initialized them to. And when we hit play, you'll see those start move, moving around. And what happens is we take almost like snapshots of the state of the system. So for each frame that we want to render, we look at where the particles are or where they were last frame rather. Mm -hmm. Then we calculate the force between each of the particles. So like this particle experiences a force from this guy and this guy and this guy and so on. And we use good old Newton's second law, F equals MA, or rather mm -hmm. acceleration equals force divided by mass. We use that to figure out what acceleration the particle should have. And then we can do some numerical analysis uh, to figure out what its new velocity should be as a result. How's its velocity going to change? And how's its position going to change for the next frame? Mm -hmm. So each frame is like a time step. So as we move forward in time, we get these discrete snapshots and we let the particles kind of move under these Newtonian mechanics from snapshot to snapshot. So I just want to draw attention over here as well. This is what's called a radial distribution function. Mm -hmm. And I won't go into too much detail, but this is like a probability distribution of saying, what is the probability of finding two atoms with this distance in between them? So. Basically, this here is zero. So right now we have zero probability of finding atoms right on top of each other. And this big spike here is the distance from here to here, this principal dimension okay. in the lattice. And the cool thing about crystalline lattices is you can see that it repeats, right? It's uh, this little square. Just basically, you can tile it across this whole space, and it's got yep. what's called a long-range order. And you can see these very sharp peaks, which are characteristic of this type of crystalline solid. And lastly, we have temperature, volume, and number of particles as a thing. So okay. I'm going to start the simulation. Oh, actually, any questions before I start? Um, I was just slowly getting my head around that graph you're talking us through. Uh, <laughs> I sure, think I sure. understand it. So, so when it says um, maybe that's sort of the peak at just just above one is is about thirty eight forty something like that. Yeah, yeah. That, that means that we've got that many ish particles in the in the lattice. Does that kind of correlate? So, Roughly, or I oh, know it says n particles is five hundred. Yes. So I think this so, is not normalized. So yes. Okay. Okay. So so the the just above one is is the lattice's uh, pitch or, or the distance between. Yeah. And then you've got something at one point six. Is that and that is like the diagonal? Is that right? That's the yeah. diagonal. Yeah. And then just and then below two is like the the twice step or. Exactly. Okay. And so as this runs, what are we looking for in that graph? Anything in particular, or is it just interesting to see? So what's useful about this is it can tell you about the state of the material. So I'm going to give a demonstration of a phase change where, much like water melting, we're mm -hmm. going to go from a solid phase. As I increase the temperature while the simulation's running, it will melt and go into a liquid phase. Okay. So while it's in the solid phase, we see these characteristic peaks that are very sharply sort of peaked, which means the atoms are very tightly bunched together, and they have this very close ordering. But then as we melt, we'll see that the shape of this graph changes, and that tells us that it's actually not in the crystalline solid phase anymore. OK, so so A, we've got the 2D representation of the particles on the left, and yes. B, we've got this graph, which can give us an indication of the uh, stability, I guess, of the material. Yeah, or the structure. Structure, OK, cool. Yep. And this quantity, by the way, this um, radial distribution function, it's useful as a diagnostic. Mm -hmm. um, but for things like solids, this is actually measurable with some transformations. 
because a crystalline lattice, you can actually use what's called X-ray diffraction to bounce X-rays off of it, and they will have some specific pattern as they come out the other end. Very that cool. is characteristic of the crystal structure. Okay. So this is not just like an arbitrary thing. We could, if we had the equipment and we could build a system like this in real life, actually measure this pro property, but it's easier to calculate it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's hit start. Mm -hmm. So right now it's at a temperature of 0 0.5. This is not Celsius or Kelvin. This is what's called natural units. It's just easier to run the calculation if your units are kind of close to one, if you're okay. round off errors. Um, so right now they're kind of still hovering around these lattice points, right? Mm -hmm. You've still got this very obvious crystalline order and we can see in the function on the right, we've still got these like sharp peaks. So when we're looking at that, we've got uh, what looks like a number of atoms on each spot yes is that um is that kind of a i don't yeah. just call it how, how's that represented what, what's going on there that's a that's a good point i should have mentioned this to start with so okay. this is a two-dimensional slice of a three-dimensional um yeah. simulation so if we could sort of look at this and rotate it around we would see that they're all in a box so this okay. pattern is repeated in the x direction the y direction and the z direction kind of into the page but okay, as so it stands, we're kind of just looking down the crystal. So these are kind of behind each other. Got you. Okay. As they're oscillating around here. Cool. They're not overlapping with each other. Mm -hmm. And we'll see in a little bit that the particles can kind of bounce off each other as we increase the temperature. <laughs> okay. So this is a live demonstration. Here's hoping that it'll work. I gave it a test <laughs> last time, but it's always nerve-wracking. So you can see as we increase the temperature to 0 0.7, the particles are visibly moving faster than they were at 0 0.5. Okay. And that's what temperature means in this sense. Temperature is kind of like how much jiggle do the atoms have in the solid? And the faster they move on average, the higher the temperature. Mm -hmm. It's a very rough hand wavy definition of what we call kinetic temperature. So as we sure. increase the temperature, the particles move faster. So let's move it to 1.0 faster still and some of them are starting to shift around between lattice sites there's a couple that move uh, and i want to point out here uh, before we go that this system has what's called periodic boundary conditions and it's just a way to make sure that uh, we don't have particles bouncing off walls so if you sort of pay attention near the edges occasionally a particle will kind of bounce off the top of the screen and it'll come back in on the bottom again okay and this is means that if we do the maths properly we can actually treat this finite size system, which is a relatively small particle, but we, when we do the maths, we will get behavior that is very similar to if we had a really, really big system. Because it's kind of like, this just continues off the screen indefinitely. And as a particle dips off into this edge of the screen, another one comes in from this side. Yeah. So it's kind of equivalent to having a really big uh, okay. system. Hand wavy, but close yeah. enough. <laughs> uh, so we crack it up to 1.5, we can see we get a lot more movement from the particles. And this structure factor is now different, right? It doesn't have the same sort of sharp peaks that it had before. And the particles are visibly moving around a lot more. And there's a lot less obvious structure. Mm -hmm. And as we go to 2.0 temperature, our system has now basically completely melted. There's no obvious order. There isn't that crystalline structure anymore. Particles are kind of zipping around quite a bit. They're bouncing off each other, as we can sort of see up here. And um, this is pretty characteristic of, I believe, it's called a supercritical liquid, but it's kind of like a liquid, basically. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty much what happens in the real world. When you have something like ice, your water molecules are tightly bound to some crystalline structure. And they kind of, they have some energy, they can jiggle around, but they can't move very far from it because they're all kind of bound together, right? And they they sort of have some attractive force and the thermal velocity, how fast the particles move, they don't have enough energy to break out of that. So they stay in this crystalline structure. And as it heats up, eventually that structure breaks down and the molecules are free to move around as you will. And then when you boil it, they're even more energetic and they just kind of take off into the atmosphere. Now, That's very cool. The, yeah, the thing I wanted to show as a demo is we can go the opposite direction as well. And we can reduce the temperature even further 
now we can see that they're not moving around anywhere near as much. Mm -hmm. But if we go all the way back down to our original temperature, 0 0.5, we don't actually recover our initial crystalline lattice state. So you can see they're a lot more slowly moving and they don't move around the screen as much. Mm -hmm. They'll eventually settle into some really low energy state. Um, but we have so is, is, covered is a this color. system settling still or is this is this is it going to yeah. stay here for, so it's, forever? It, there is some degree of settling and if i wanted to do a really scientifically rigorous system i would have to let it run for you know maybe ten thousand time steps okay. um, ten thousand frames at each temperature to get good statistics right it's just a demo but yeah. it will eventually settle down to a thing where you get some particle motion but they kind of don't really move around very much at all mm -hmm. so it's kind of cool because it's not quite correct. If anyone from my work is watching <laughs> this, you know, I'm aware that this is not strictly how it works, but it's kind of an interesting uh, duality with what goes on in the real world where, have you ever done that thing where you put some like water in the freezer in a like really pure water in the freezer in a really smooth glass and it won't actually freeze called. straight away? Yeah. Super freezing or super yeah. cooling. And you can watch yeah, it happening. Yeah, you give it a tap, and then all of yeah. a sudden it just instantly freezes. <laughs> so it's because it's quite hard to actually recover this crystalline uh, structure just by like quenching the temperature in molecular mm -hmm. dynamics. The slower your temperature, uh, the the lower your temperature, the slower the particles move around, and so it takes longer to kind of relax into this preferred configuration than it does to melt and get this mm -hmm. this structure. And in order to get it to kick it along, uh, one way you can sort of do it is to start with some portion of your thing in a crystal and some portion of it in a liquid and drop the temperature. And it'll kind of grow out from that crystalline thing into okay. a proper solid. And I have a, a, uh, a movie that was prepared earlier because that yeah. is far too difficult to run in real time on my computer. <laughs> But did you have any more questions about this before we move on to that? Uh, nothing in particular, but but this is kind of a good example of of what we're talking about when you when you're talking about your sort of simulation and, and work in the software world, I guess. Is that yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. admittedly, it's a toy project. It's not not real or rigorous or anything, as you said, but it's still real in inverted commas in in so much as it's it represents what you work on. And yeah. Yeah. And this is a somewhat accurate picture of what is going on deep down at the molecular level in mm -hmm. your glass of water or what have you. Yeah. And it's, it's a good teaching tool in that regard. Yeah. So you can see we're getting some sort of reforming of the, the lattice definitely, structure. There's yeah. definitely some banding. If we left it running for a very long time, it might do something. But <laughs> I, I'm conscious of the fact that we're well over time. So Yes. Well, I'll thank you for showing us that. All right. Last one. This yeah. is a demonstration of water. Uh, that was done by my boss, Deborah, and a former group member, Yuan Su, as a demonstration. This was done on a supercomputer, took mm -hmm. hours to generate, um, and then rendered using a program called VMD, which is specifically designed for visualizing molecular trajectories. And if we let it run, we can see that, oh, come on, please run. It's just a <laughs> dot .move file. What, there we go. Excellent. Um, so one of these is at a temperature just slightly above zero degrees Celsius. So mm -hmm. your crystals will start to melt. And one of them is at a temperature just below zero degrees Celsius. So your liquid phase here will slowly crystallize out. So you can see this top one here is melting and this bottom one here is freezing as we go. That's amazing, yeah. And, and so this is this is what we're talking about just now with the pure water in a in a smooth glass or similar is that right yeah yeah that, same that general you, principle that this is effectively in a perfect world and it is a perfect set of molecules if that's the right word yeah and so the crystal is growing effectively yeah exactly and then eventually right now it's fully yeah. crystallized that's and similarly cool. up top it's melting yeah, yeah it's a very tricky thing water is surprisingly difficult to simulate uh, on a computer, by the way. It's a really nasty molecule for being the most common one that we're surrounded with. <laughs> yeah. But, That's um, brilliant. Yeah. 
in principle, you can do real science with this, right? Like if you've got a good enough water model, you can use things like what is the latent heat? How much energy do I have to pump into the system to get it to melt? Or mm -hmm. how much energy do I have to pull out to get it to freeze? And that would correspond to real world values. And we can do yeah. it with more exotic materials than just water to again, sort of inform experimental uh, considerations. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Cool. So I think that's the end of the demos. We can yeah, go back to the, uh, Back to camera. Thanks. Yeah. Um, cool. Thank you. And and um, I love seeing sort of the output. And do you have any sort of idea or rough rough gut feel for how long that might have taken to do the first step, which is the uh, running on the the compute cluster, and then the second step, which is actually rendering it out to a video file, effectively? If I recall correctly, I think Deborah. My boss, who was involved with making this, said that it was like several hours of compute time on a cluster across mm -hmm. multiple nodes. So that could be, you know, I don't know. My my sort of intuition for the number of more water molecules you have with that, maybe if you were doing it on like, say, 64 cores, it might take you, I don't know, like <laughs> five or yep. six hours, maybe, possibly okay. even more. Yeah. It's a no, don't very worry too much. Well just, simulation. Just, just some kind of uh, like a feel for it. It's, it's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I think it's a pretty cool demonstration of yeah, you know, exactly what it is we do. <laughs> I think there was one more topic that you're particularly keen to talk about. Um, if you've sure. got time for it. Yeah. Yeah. If if you're happy with me going a little more than a little we're, bit over. we're way over, but um, I'm happy to hear about it. And I'd love love for you to have the chance to talk about it. So please do. Sure, I'll try and be brief. Uh, I'm really interested in um, a lot of the policy and community aspects around research software engineering as a discipline. So taking a lot of stuff from software engineering as distinct from writing code, things like reliability, testing, controlling for complexity, managing sort of a user base and user experience in that, and taking it into the world of scientific computing. Because historically that's been a very neglected field, but now, so to speak, those chickens are kind of coming home to roost. And there's a real problem with both reproducibility of scientific code, where like, you kind of, you need to run simulations using the exact version that someone else had. And that might involve mailing a professor to get a bunch of loose Fortran files or whatever. <laughs> or it might mean trying to dig through a paper to figure out what exact version of this molecular dynamics code did they have? How did they run it? What libraries did they use? because choice of numerical libraries can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. But it's also just things like productivity, right? Like you don't want to have to spend all of your time fixing bugs in code. You want to be able to add a new feature, some new physics that you want to simulate and be reasonably sure that you haven't broken everything. And that's typically where a lot of software engineering practices come in, right? You're interested in managing this complexity and having some budget for like, failures and technical debt and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And a, a simple fact that research computing hardware, as we mentioned with GPUs and complicated CPUs and that, is getting more complicated as time goes on. And it's only going to get more complicated. And it's very hard for a scientist whose job is to do science to keep up with a lot of this complexity. Mm -hmm. So there's a strong need for people to come in and have this as their area of specialization to sort of do division of labor and say, I will write the code, I will do this engineering practices to make sure it's correct and it's easy to use and it scales out to all the stuff we need and you focus on doing the science and we can work together and pool our skills and everything's great. But the problem with a lot of that that has typically gotten in the way is a lot of academic institutions have been very, very bad at rewarding that kind of work. There either hasn't been a career path at all to do this or if there is, you kind of have to scrounge together different funding sources and you have to like write papers on the side to sort of keep the administrators at bay and keep your position mm -hmm. going. And it's not conducive to doing, you know, actually good quality software development because it's it's necessarily a side job or an afterthought. So there is a, a growing movement in the scientific community to recognize this role called research software engineering, just so we can all agree on the terminology, <laughs> and try and incentivize stakeholders in governments and funding agencies and universities, and even just academics that like, hey, this is important. 
Software is a big deal. It's not just something that you can get a postgrad to write and then be done with it. You actually do need to think about this as a serious piece of scientific equipment. Mm -hmm. And if you want it to be good and for the science to be correct and robust usable and repeatable and, and robust, yeah, 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 all that good stuff, yeah. you need to pay somebody to do this. It all comes down to money in the end of things, but it also comes down to being aware that this is a problem that needs to be solved that is currently not very well suited. So if I may sort of um, mm -hmm. ask a question quickly, you know, today you or, or historically you've had the clusters and the machines and the people to manage the machines and then the academics, is that almost yeah. the way it has been? And there's yep. no one to tell machines what to do. And it's always been sort of put on the academics and they don't have time and they've got to do papers and, you know, they've got to do yeah. the, the real research, all this kind of thing. Is that, is that kind of correct? Yeah, exactly. And sometimes uh, the supercomputing centers that run the clusters, they might have one or two people on staff who can actually spend time writing code. You know, they might say, we have a whole bunch of computational chemistry research on our cluster. We can afford to hire someone to write computational chemistry code and optimize okay. it and fix bugs and that sort of stuff. But it's always been a very much a, a small number of people and always like very tenuous sort of career stability as well. Mm -hmm. And and that so, removal from the people doing the research and the institution, the university or whatever it might be, mm. probably doesn't help the situation as well. Is that right? Yeah, that's a really good point. Like there's a, a trade-off where the closer you are to a research group, like I'm actually embedded in a research group. I share an yeah. office, I eat lunch yeah. with them, that sort of stuff. It's so good. Yeah. I have a I have a great idea of what everyone's doing and we can work closely together and we have a really fast cool. turnaround to get stuff done. But I can only really work with that one research group. Whereas mm -hmm. the further up you are, the more people you can uh, work with and the greater a user base you can service, but at the same time, you're necessarily more disconnected from the research and you can't get quite as in-depth. And yeah. it's not clear to me or potentially anybody where the sweet spot is, or even if there's multiple sweet spots as to how to do this. <laughs> That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's difficult, so it's, but it's... I'm, I'm, I'm glad you've got the position you're in and I hope that it sort of becomes more prevalent, I guess. that. It, yeah. yeah, I'm really fortunate to have it. And I'm trying to really push and get the word out to people in channels like this and in yeah. academic conferences and other places to just be like, hey, this is the thing that exists. A, if you're a scientist who likes writing code, you can do this job. You, can, <laughs> you don't have to do the typical postdoc. B, if you're a professional software engineer who likes science and maybe wants to work in this sort of field, uh, this is something where there's a lot of demand for it and mm -hmm. there's a growing demand for this and you can really like make a name for yourself and make a difference. There is that sort of high-minded ideal of like science, right? We're making the world better. We're working on batteries and desalination and all these big problems, yeah. right? You know, that's satisfying to a certain type of person. But also to funding bodies to be like, hey, you know, get your act together. Research software is important. And it just starts with people raising awareness of that. Mm. Brilliant. Do you so, think that the um, the drive to produce output papers and things is kind of bred into people during their university career and then that it's kind of expected and that the it's difficult to sort of put that down and say I don't mind about the papers anymore I don't want to get my name out I want to write the software oh yeah oh yeah did I've you have to go through that and, and how did you yeah. yeah okay yeah adjusting to that of like not so much the anxiety of I should be writing papers but sort of having this feeling of like Am I getting recognized for this? Mm -hmm. You know, is this going acknowledged by, you know, not just people who make decisions and who can handle promotions and that sort of stuff? Because I know some of them, my boss and my boss's boss are fine with that. But also just from a, a pure, you know, humans, we're social creatures. We like to think that our work is respected and mm. appreciated. And there is that anxiety of like, do other academics view me as having like, you know, wasting time when I could be writing papers or something <laughs> rather than writing code. I mean, I know some of them do. I, I, oh, no, I, okay. Yes. <laughs> I had discussions like that, and it's it's kind of, I don't know, how do you how do you deal with that? I don't know. You don't, oh. maybe. Yeah. But there's, there's some interesting movements. I do want to give a shout out to the Australian Research Data Commons mm -hmm. and also the Research Software Alliance. Uh, RISA is based out of the UK. ARDC is obviously based out of Australia. They're doing a lot of work on making research software a visible, citable output 
from research activities. So rather than having the process of you write a paper and tell everyone, hey, please cite that paper, you can just publish the code and get a persistent identifier for that code, and then people can cite that, and that will track your citation metrics. So now the code itself becomes a research output that can then get used in not just performance evaluations, but going to the bigwigs and say, hey, we have like a thousand people using our code. <laughs> Give us some money so we can keep developing it and growing the reach. Very good. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So there is there is movement in the sphere, but it, it's slow. And yeah. kind of everyone needs to put their shoulder <laughs> to the grindstone and actually get doing. Yeah. Fair enough. I think we're probably um, around about the end. Oh, yeah. Now. Yeah. Um, is there anything okay. else you'd like to shout out about or, or say just before we close up? Yeah, I guess um, I'd like to shout out to the research software engineering movement as a whole. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of research software engineering societies all throughout the world. There's one in the UK. They're actually the first to get on board this bandwagon. Uh, Germany, Netherlands, USA, Australia. I'm sure there's others that I'm forgetting. And just like check out your local research software engineering society and see if there's anything interesting uh, that appeals to you there. And uh, yeah, also, I guess, check out my website. I write stuff there. There's contact details on it. I'm sure that's in the show notes. Yep, I think it is. If it's not, I will put it there. <laughs> Sweet. But uh, yeah, fantastic. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining oh, us today. It's been so good. Thanks it's for been having brilliant me. to yeah. talk and another long one. <laughs> yes. I, I wonder oh, if these need to so become much. a little bit long, long format. But no, it's fantastic. Very interesting. I guess thank you experiment for and stuff. see. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for letting me uh, share this stuff. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay. So I think that's probably goodbye from us then. We'll wrap Bye, it up. Everybody. Okay. Bye, everyone.